What's going on guys? Super Tuesday. We bring it to you live every week. And we love it. What's going on? Hey, guys. Exciting stream tonight and you may not know why it's so exciting, but you will, right? You don't know what you don't know until you know and tonight you're going to know. We talk about sort of the strategy to repotting that we take at Mirai, particularly with the collected piece of material, where we say, listen, that first repot, we try to conform the root system to a container that creates the space that's actually going to constrict and reduce the ability for those roots to run and create coarse growth. Now, in doing so, we always are conforming and creating a root system that we can utilize. This is point number one that you guys have to keep in mind, okay? But beyond that, when we do that initial repot, we know with our conifers, we can never bear root the root system, and we always need to leave some portion of that root system untouched. Now, that means, and that sets the strategy to get it into a container that constricts the root growth and is appropriate aesthetically for the tree without bare rooting or leaving some portion untouched. We're always reducing the far points of the root system to pull that root mass into the size that fits into this container. And as a result, the question that a lot of you guys have had is, what about that native root system right around the base of the tree that obviously still has field soil and it isn't favorable to a balance of water and oxygen? What do you do about that? And this is where we come to the second repotting and tonight's stream to put it all together. Got Sam on the mic this evening. Hi guys. Got Josh producing the stream. Woo! Even Jesus doing what they do. And uh, Twinkle Toes is back with us in studio. We missed him last week. Good to have you back, Mr. Liminator. Let's blast off. So basically, this is the Ponderosa Pine, one of the first Ponderosa Pines I actually put into a bonsai container to try and see how could we handle needle reduction with a Ponderosa when I first got back from Japan. This is still the same pot, has never been potted again, or for a second time since 2010, right? And this has really been the tree that's been the test subject of how far can we go? How far can we, can we constrict? What are the indicators in the tree that are telling us we need to come back to the root system? Now, you notice, or, or you should notice, or if you're not noticing, please notice the really small, universal size of the needle mass across the tree. Now, this tree has also never been wired again since 2010, which is why it looks the way that it does. And it also has not been pruned since 2010, which is very, very interesting. Obviously, the top is taking on a lot of strength, Lower branches are getting a little weaker. We're at that point where we are gonna to need to do some pruning. Established in the foliar mass, and we notice that the height of the root system raising up out of the container. And every single year from 2000, uh, let's see, we're in 2019. From 2017, 2018, we were like, should we repot or should we let it go another year? Because the tree never showed us any stress, never any disease, never any needle cast, never any susceptibility to insects, no branch dieback, no yellowing, nothing. It has thrived in this container since 2010. Right? So this is actually entering its 10th season of growth in this container and the sheen and that initial native core of, of field soil never been touched. Tonight we're going to go ahead and see what that looks like, dissect this second process of repotting where we're going to really focus on leaving those exterior roots intact to, to dig into the core of that root system. We're going to set this tree back down in the container as it's been lifting itself up. All of the things that we need to address in a second repotting let us begin. Okay, so first and foremost, obviously we have a lot of valuable moss that's accumulated, a lot of age and in in patina on the surface of this. I'm gonna just take my paint scraper, trusty dusty, I love this tool. We're gonna put it to use tonight in multiple ways. And I'm gonna try to remove as big of a sheet of moss as I can every time that I remove the moss. Now I'm gonna get up close to the trunk, but I love the age. And I'm gonna go ahead and rotate this just so Jesus can kind of blast in to some of this really interesting lichen growth on the base of this tree. This is um, pixie cups, as they're commonly known and affectionately coined, but these are a lichen that take a tremendous amount of time to form. Now, a lot of you guys should be asking the question, wow, you have a lot of lichen and it's growing up the trunk. Is that good or is that bad? Depends on who you are, depends on how you feel, because we do know that the lichen will be decomposing the bark of the tree. 
When we let that kind of lichen occupation occur, it's a significant indication of age but will impede the bark over time. We've kind of got to choose, is the bark more valuable or the indication of age from the lichen more valuable? And on this tree, so far in its existence and history, I'm going to say that the lichen has proven to be a little bit more interesting and a little bit more of a gesture of age than the original bark that was on the trunk. We may change our opinion of that tonight. So far, I've left it. If I wanted to get rid of it, a treatment of vinegar sprayed or applied to the lichen would allow it to dry up, we'd allow it to crumble off, and we'd be back to bark development. Okay, so I'm just removing the moss right off of the surface, trying to avoid as much as I can getting too much of the soil in here. And let me just kind of show you guys the bottom of this. Very nice, thin, limited amount of soil, extremely close to the moss itself. And there's a reason for this. We're gonna be coming back and showing you guys how to actually apply moss in the work that we need to do to prep a tree for show or exhibition. So the actual application of this moss, to have this moss very thin and in large sheets starts to facilitate a really beautiful, usable form of moss for the show mossing. Uh, execution of a technique. We're gonna be using this combined with other moss. So I'm just gonna set this off to the side here. We'll come back uh, to that in a later feature piece of content to deal with this. Now let's just take a, a brief look at the surface and you can see this is slammed full of roots. There's fine roots all the way up here at the surface. You can see the roots sort of creeping up and out of the edge of the container. I'm gonna say that we definitely let this go too far. This is not what we aspire to achieve when we start to look at, is a tree ready to be repotted? And I'm assuming what we're gonna see is thick roots accumulating in the bottom of this container to push this tree up and out of the container. And that kind of formation of roots is not favorable towards a really refined tree. So we can get that reduced needle mass, we can get that scaled root system that we strive for in the confined environment. If we leave it too long, particularly with our long needle single flush pines more adapted to oxygen, higher oxygen content to have that success of the water oxygen balance. We can start to, they will actually push themselves out and we can start to reverse the process with those thick roots and get big coarse needles again. It was definitely past due. Again, this is an experimental piece and we have a lot of work to do on this tonight. So let's go ahead and start the removal process from the container. Now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna start working with my comma here. Comma, a tool that we should all have in our toolkit, particularly if we're dealing with established bonsai. Notice the serrated edges, the shape of this, okay? This is what allows us to free the roots up from the wall of the container. Now, when we start to look at the use of a comma, typically a lot of us with the use of our comma will dig down and we'll try to cut and we'll try to tear and we'll dig down in there and just get, get, get. That's not how we use a comma, okay? When we use a comma, we wanna be using the comma from the tip just scraping, right? Scraping, notice how I'm holding here, just kind of really choked up on the comma so I have control. If I'm back here, I'm kind of flailing, I can damage the patina on the pot. So I'm choked up and I'm just using that tip just to scrape and start to open that space. Now again, as I'm doing this, if I just change the angle of my comma slightly, okay? I can start to open up a little bit of a larger wedge shape in the, in the rim of that container, and it gives me the space to be able to remove a lot of the soil that's kind of locked into that wall-rim relationship between the root system and the container itself. So I'm going to dig in with the comma, try to free this up. I can turn it to Eve. I'm going to let me come back to this side and just kind of show so Eve and Jesus. Can you see this? Eve, probably not, huh? Jesus can. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and use that tip just to open that up. You can see all of that stuff that's coming off. Use that tip. Now here's where we open up that space. I just changed that angle a little bit. Take the crown off of the top of that root system and now we start to see that space open up between the wall of the container and the root mass of the tree. And again, I wanna just be sort of slowly and systematically scraping. I don't wanna dig in, I don't wanna to try to saw, I don't wanna be rough, I wanna use the comma and its cutting action to be able to free that root mass. And I need to get this comma all the way down to the bottom in order to safely extract this tree from the container because it's so tight, this is gonna be a lot of work. So while I'm freeing it from the container, I'm gonna turn questions over to Sam just so that we can stay caught up on those as we work this and try to get this into a situation we can further advance. Thank you. Um, so. 
Tom, just back to that lichen, um, if you wanted to get rid of the lichen, Tom wants to know if you would use vinegar 50-50 or full strength. I would go full strength on over-the-counter vinegar, which I believe is still, is still a very minimal amount of actual uh, acidic vinegar that's in full strength over-the-counter available vinegar. Um, and the reason that vinegar works so well is be just because of the caustic action of the, of the acidic compound and lichen not really being super hyped on that. Um, and then you have to let the lichen dry out and actually start to fall off on its own. And it'll take a few weeks. If you continue to moisten the tree and keep that lichen wet after the vinegar, a lot of times it can dilute the vinegar and the lichen will come back or the moss will come back before it ever actually um, ha effectively is removed from the tree. So we've got to be careful of that a little bit uh, in the effectiveness of the application of vinegar. But once, once this has attached itself, it's actually, you know, putting hyphae into the bark, little roots as they pertain to moss and lichen, uh, fungi and bacteria of any sort. And that, those hyphae are ex excreting enzymes into that organic matter to decompose it. And this is how they work in the natural system as decomposers. In these sh shady, high moisture areas, it releases those enzymes, release and break down that organic material into a lot of humic acids and humates, which we know to be very good for a tree, but we don't necessarily want them breaking down our bark or we need to know that that's gonna happen when we make that in, in decision intelligently. All right, um, so Marsha, just following up on that, you, you do have to protect uh, the root area from the vinegar, Protect correct? the root area, definitely cover your roots. If it's gonna be close to the base of the tree, you know, you would wanna skirt on this and then you would wanna spray that with vinegar to get rid of that. That mm. might be something that we should, um, show the execution of in a piece of feature content just so people see it. I will write it down. Um, <clears throat> uh, Daniel wants to know, will ponderosa bonsai ever show that caramel colored bark that full size wild trees exhibit? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, if I just turn this as I'm sort of working here and hey Zeus, just kind of show this area here where some of the bark has sloughed off and you'll actually see those caramel tones anywhere where it's shed bark. And what we kind of recognize in the natural environment, those caramel tones come from the natural shedding of the bark. It's assisted by a lot of wind, by uh, abrasive debris in that wind, by snow, by rain, by animals. Um, when we're cultivating them in bonsai, we typically really cherish and value that bark, and that's why we don't see those caramel tones so present in the bonsai cultivation. If you wanted to see those caramel tones, you could always remove the bark to be able to bring out that color play. And in all actuality, there are trees that have been displayed uh, in Japan in terms of red pine, um, and a few other different species where the pines themselves have been stripped of bark to bring out those tones where the bark wasn't the value and it was an artistic decision that was made. Not recommending that you do that, but if you wanted to see those color tones, that's what would have to happen. Uh, David wants to know, how can you sharpen uh, a comma? Can't sharpen a comma because you've got a serration that's gonna break down over the course of time. Um, this is a tool that in using it in a granular substrate is constantly going to wear down, so we're always having to renew our commas. This one definitely on the end of its sort of leg of being effective. It's, it's quite worn out, which makes getting a tree particularly this tight and constricted in the container makes it a little bit more work for me. By the end of this, I'll be breathing quite, quite aggressively, I'm sure. And I, I think you're answering this question right now, but Mark wants to know if you're going to loosen the pot on all four sides. All four sides for a tree that's this root bound. To be sure, there's no way to get it out without loosening all four sides. And I'm going to have to penetrate fairly deep into the container. So this is a process. And one of the, one of the th reasons to do this on, on uh, the live stream is because I don't think that there's a lot of significant knowledge or a really healthy practice around how to get established trees out of the container safely without damaging the root system or damaging the container. And we see that particularly when people say, I hate those inward curving lips because you just got to break the container to get the tree out or, you know, you have to tear the root system apart. And that's not true. This is just the use of the comma in terms of freeing it. This has a slight inward curve to the lip. Obviously, it's not dramatic, but I've really got to be intelligent and I've got to be diligent 
about coming in here and getting that wall of roots that's matted against this. We know the roots are gonna occupy the wall. I've got to get all of that out and create the space for this tree to actually separate from the container. Now, one of the things we look at too, what is the angle of that wall? Notice that the container actually flares out at the top, which means it drops in here. So I'm not gonna have to work as hard as if this were a straight walled container or we had that inward curve at the upper lip. Any way we go about it though, the use of the comma is the key to successfully removing a tree like this from its container when it gets bound into it to be able to, and what we're really doing is protecting the root system itself because we're gonna take off these roots on the outer wall that are matted together regardless, whether we use a comma, whether we use a chopstick, or whether we use scissors. Makes sense to go ahead and do that now and free the tree, preserve the root system in the container, and preserve the container itself. Uh, and Leonard wants to know, could you use a mossy sand wart in place of moss, like when you're putting moss back on? A mossy what? Mossy sand wart. Um, Sounds a little close to soap wart to me. I'm and look it if up. it is close to soap wart, um, those types of fungi and bacteria can be very constricting to the movement of oxygen into your container if it has any relationship or close proximity to soap wart. Um, and so I would say be very, very careful about that. The benefit of moss is it doesn't actually impede oxygen flow if we allow the moss to establish with the roots post repot, hence the top dressing and the ground up scenario that we create. But beyond that, it also doesn't, once it's established, it doesn't produce a significant root system to compete for water and nutrient uptake like a lot of accent pieces that we could put in the container can potentially rival the tree for the uptake of those resources. And then there are those uh, certain varieties of ground covers and whatnot that do impede oxygen movement and create an anaerobic environment to thrive, like soap wart. So we need to be very careful of that because balance of water and oxygen, particularly in a tree that has that kind of lean towards the oxygen, higher oxygen content, like a ponderosa pine or a long needle single flush, definitely needs to make sure that we're getting air movement through that soil column. Um. Rafi wants to know, would you in specific cases like this one also allow moss up the trunk as a sign of age or would you only keep the lichen? You know, lichen is, lichen is a very, very, so this kind of lichen, you can't inoculate the soil with this kind of lichen and have it take, right? This kind of lichen takes four or five years to even begin to form. It's a very old, takes time, the right enzymatic and fungal bacteria uh, compositions have to be there prior to the lichen occupying it and that takes time. So this is a real indication of age, whereas moss is very quick. Moss is a lot wetter. This lichen is a very dry lichen, which is why it can survive on a tree that gets watered a limited amount compared to our other bonsai. So it kind of has connotation beyond just sort of moss and the pretty green. It has that connotation of age where I see it being a little bit more valuable. Uh, and I guess that's why I feel like it, it is quasi appropriate to potentially choose to leave it on the trunk if we find it to be aesthetically pleasing. Cool. And then Keegan wants to know if this is a Randy Knight tree. This is a Randy Knight tree, like old school Randy Knight tree. This is a tree that was collected in 2007 or 2006. And I acquired it while I was still in Japan, did the styling work on it in 2008, 9, 2009, when I was back from Japan experimenting with the trees, potted it in 2010, and it has just rocked ever since. So this has been a, a tree that um, has really been at the forefront of sort of our experimentations and bonsai and the potting process uh, and what the container can do to constrict and start to really control the growth of our trees. I love this tree. It's a very simple ponderosa pine. It's not extravagant in any way. Um, and when we come back and we really do the pruning and rebalancing, it's gonna be beautiful. I wanted to have that done for tonight's stream. Um, my flights got screwed up in New York this past weekend, so it is what it is. Okay, a few things that I want you guys to notice. The stair step foot on this Yamaaki pot, okay? These are very, very delicate feet. And when we're dealing with ceramics, we always need to keep in mind the fact that the features of the ceramic can be very fragile if they're handled inappropriately. So I never wanna put all the weight of the pot as I'm leaning the tree on these feet. 
As I slide this on a bench, these feet can separate from the container very easily, even in a really highly made, really quality container. So we've got to be very careful about that, okay? So I'm kind of aware of that. Now also be aware of when we look at, and Jesus, go ahead and just show sort of the bark formation under this. I mean, this tree has in the limited time that it's been a bonsai, 10 years, has put on phenomenal bark. I mean, this is really phenomenal bark formation. This is what happens when it's in a bonsai container. We actually get better bark growth in a bonsai container than we do in the natural environment. We typically are seeing that tree in the natural environment hundreds of years after it started. But when we get them into a bonsai container, they start to put on a lot of vascular growth with the feeding, with the watering, with the soil substrate that we're using and that produces more bark. So as I'm repotting this tree, I never wanna grab that bark. I'm always looking for a gin or some place in the canopy that I can be placing my hands and just working around that bark, preserving that bark, because this is the major feature and value of pines, okay? Now, coming back to the bottom of the container, I'm always gonna cut my tie-down wires in the middle and then fold them straight. Now, one thing you guys should be saying is, whoa, this has been in there since 2010 and you still have steel wire intact in the bottom of the container. Yes, this is one of the reasons that we use that electrical fence galvanized wire and this is one of the trees that we really saw this be valuable on. It is possible for this in a tree that has less water requirements like a long needle single flush pine to potentially last for nine or 10 years with that galvanization that also allows electrical con uh, conduct conductiveness through that wire. Um, and so I cut it in the middle, I fold it, and then I cut it. Now you'll see that I've got roots growing out of every single hole down here. I mean, this tree has really been constricted by this container. So I wanna be very aware of that. And I'm gonna go ahead and because they're already growing through the screens, I don't wanna have any constriction of the tree coming out of this container. I'll just fold my, my screen wires up as well. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna pick that point right up here at the top where I can just exert a little bit of force. Now I'm gonna hold the container here with my hand. I'm gonna go ahead and be, be careful of the bark. And I'm just gonna see if we can separate that, and you saw how fast that happens. So when we have our arms straight, that is to say, if we're pushing with a bent arm, that tree, when it releases, is gonna fly as far away from that container as your arm has the time to extend. So if we have, when that's in that container, if we have a straight arm and we use our body weight to lean into it and we hold that container, we have the ability to stop that separation very, very quickly, okay? So now that it's separated, I don't want that container to fall. I'm gonna protect those feet. I'm gonna come back up here and then I can go ahead and come back to a safer area that's not gonna damage the bark and just pull this tree up and out of the container. And I'm gonna go ahead and set the container off to the side here. <laughs> now, when we're dealing with a tree that has this kind of angle and lean, always really intelligent for us to have a system of blocks that can give us some relief so that we can let our hands sit free for a minute and just let the tree be, right? And so having that prepared before we start a repot on our own, we've got a lot of really old deadwood, we've got very valuable bark, there's not a lot of places to grab this if something goes wrong, having that prepared, very intelligent, okay? And before we dig into the bottom of this root mass, I really wanna start by identifying where in the base of the tree does the root system exist? Because with that organic material, being added on top and moss and the decomposition and soil and all of that, there's a nabari under this that we've lost over the course of time. This is where we wanna start the repotting process. So I'm gonna rotate the tree and I'm gonna start by working the nabari of the tree to find out what do we have there in the surface? How far down do we go to get below this really dark decomposed material and get down to that friable intact soil? That's gonna be the indicator that we've gone far enough and we know water is gonna be able to get back into the core of that root system. Let me go ahead and just rotate the tree so that you guys can kind of see this process from the detail cams. Hey Zeus and Eve, let me block this guy up again. Keep my work station clean. Make sure that's nice. All right. Okay, so I'm gonna just start with my chopstick, hard side, pointed side, just kind of working through that initial surface area 
and getting rid of some of that really big, black, nasty stuff that's accumulated on top of it. And again, a lot of this is just decomposed organic debris. I mean, and that is really, really intense. And as we get down into this, we're gonna start to see all of the original indications of the first repot. I see my initial bamboo stake and my tie down wire here. I see that I've got some accumulation of moss up in here and we're gonna talk about how far back do we take the moss if we're preserving the lichen. But notice that as I start to get through that, I start to tap into some friable intact pieces of pumice below this really dark black interior. I'm starting to get in. Can you see that, Eve? Just some, just some solid particles of soil and pumice that exist below that, okay? So that's kind of my first beginning indication. Ah, okay, all right, so, so the organic material, as much as it's accumulated, and we've cleaned this tree off twice in the process of its time in the bonsai container, we still have some intact soil particles, and I'm starting to see some akadama kind of come out of the woodwork here. Jesus, can you see this akadama right here, this intact soil particle? Right in this pocket right there. Now look at how far down from the surface that area of intact soil is. It's almost an inch down, and we're already getting into some fairly significant roots. So I wanna just be aware, start sort of taking in all this information of how far down I went to find that. That's gonna help influence and inform how far down I should be expecting to see those similar things over in these areas of the tree. Okay, and this, this can get quite, quite compressed, quite compact when we leave a tree in the container and we fertilize appropriately. Okay, so I'm gonna take off a lot of these smaller, skinnier roots that I'm starting to uncover. These are the roots that have been growing inside of that decomposing organic material that again has continued to sort of accumulate as we fertilize more, as more moss grows, going ahead and removing some of this stuff. And I'm coming back and I'm still taking off roots that have a fairly decent thickness to them, okay? So a fairly decent thickness to them I'm not trying to preserve all of the roots. I have a container full of these roots, okay? So I'm just coming back in here and I'm just cleanly cutting these to the surface as I take them down, not diving too far into the surface because again, we know that in this repot, we've built up this mass of roots on the exterior of the root system. We've built them on the bottom, but we've got a core that we need to be trading out, okay? I'm gonna take off a little bit up into this mossy area just to see what kind of what kind of a region do I need to open up in here to actually get down to the nabari of the tree? We may be taking off quite a bit of the lichen that exists right up against the trunk here, and I'm okay with that. I see a big, thick root back in here. Eve, can you see this root right here? Yep. Go ahead and show everybody that, because I'm using that kind of as a reference. That's a piece of nabari that I would definitely like to show that supports some of the design decisions of the tree to move so far to the left in the design uncovering these pieces because they're going to evolve, they're gonna build, they're gonna grow over the course of time. Just like the branches are gonna thicken, so are the components of the nabari. They're gonna improve and grow and thicken. They're gonna be things that we can add to the quality of the aesthetic of the tree and really work to mature in terms of our repotting process and the design solutions that we come up with to really max out the quality of this tree. Okay, so I'm just gonna, again, seeing that I have that kind of nabari, take off some of this lichen that's covering up some of that. Notice how much this is built up against the base of the tree. And we've got these beautiful roots that exist underneath it. Wow, wow, that has really, that underlayer has really accumulated and built up significantly. Um, Len Leonard wants to know if it's your intention to repot this in a smaller vessel to reduce the needle size even more. No, no, I think that when, and, and again, when we repot the tree the first time, we try to put it into a container that has that, sh that size that works with the aesthetic of the tree. Crown of the tree is a little bit overgrown, container felt a little bit small. When we go back in and we compress the design, we prune, it's gonna be perfect. The container is really perfect for this tree and that was what led to the selection of it the first time. 
Now what we're doing is we're gonna put it back into that same container, but we need to give ourselves the space here. More importantly though, we need to go into the sheen of the tree. I have to know where my Nabari is first before I go perform that action though. This is really our first step in the second potting of a tree to be able to adequately and accurately repot this tree appropriately. Because you can see, and this is a, this is the, the, the reason that this is such a good candidate for this stream is because it's gone so far beyond that point where it needed to be repotted that you can really see the, the, the a, almost an extreme version of what I'm saying to you guys where the nabari of the tree is down here and it was covered by an inch of organic mass above it. That, that is exactly what we would expect to see happen to a tree who's been fertilized appropriately, who's had moss, who's grown very uh, strong over the course of the years that it's been in this container. It, it should accumulate this mass because there's nowhere in the container when we constrict that size for it to go except for up or down. And that's what we're seeing inside of the system that we're working now. Um. David wants to know if the bamboo tie-in steak has rotted out after nine years. Um, no, it's still, I mean, it's probably, probably couldn't take a lot of torque, but it's still very much intact. I keep kind of cutting it back in here, but it's right here. And the wire that was on top of it was still very much holding the tree, which is hilarious. But look at how dark and black, as I dig around the base of this tree, just how dark and black this material is. Now this is different than the accumulated organic matter that we're taking off down to friable soil. This is actually the native field soil that exists inside of the tree. And we would have avoided really digging into the base of the tree and disturbing that native field soil in that first repot, this is what we have to come back and work in the second time around to be able to appropriately handle this tree's root system. Douglas wants to know if you're going to try to clean off the white deposits on the pot before reusing it, and if so, how? Um, I am not. Uh, so those deposits on the pots, if we get them in the Pacific Northwest, are a direct product of the moss filtering the water and secreting a lot of the toxins or any uh, high presence of calcium that exists in the water out onto the rim. Um, if I just make sure that I don't have moss on it, it will, over the course of time, via UV and the water cleanliness of the water that we're applying, it will, it will dissipate on its own. And we got an interesting question from Eric, um, who wants to know if you're going to try any of the techniques from the Soil Science podcast on this tree to encourage fungal versus bacterial microbiology, or are you going to try that stuff on less important trees? Um, I'm going to try that on a test subject, uh, a group of, of trees as test subjects after we've gotten our baseline information of what kind of flora exists in a really beautifully established tree that's showing health, what kind of flora or bacteria um, proportions exist in a tree that's having issues with its health and a balance of water and oxygen. So we have a lot of work to do baseline. That information that was on that podcast was all hypothetical. Um, and it's hypothetical coming from somebody that knows soils very well, but doesn't know bonsai at all. And this is really where I love that information and I think there's so much value in it. And also over the course of time, one of the things that we've been able to do at Mirai is we've been able to act as the buffer or a little bit of the translator between the mothership that is sort of the horticultural realm and the island that is bonsai. There's a very small bridge that connects the two. And the knowledge from horticulture doesn't necessarily cross over to bonsai one to one. It's not the same language, it's a dialect. And so inside of that, I don't just take what Ian said and believe it. I take what Ian said and I think, ooh, there's potential in that. But we have so much to establish before we can say, oh, okay, this is the next answer to bonsai. It's like, oh, there's ideas here that we can develop, that we can play with, that we can experiment and test. And then we can start to see what would be their viability with bonsai, with a granular substrate, with low organics in the shallow environment that is the ceramic body we use. These change everything about the way a plant behaves and functions, and it really changes the horticulture behind it too. So to be taking that information with a grain of salt, finding interest in it, testing out its viability, that's the next step, and we have a lot of groundwork to do before we even start to play. Uh, Kim asks, so when the root ball is so thick that its permeability is compromised, 
What do you do to restore water drainage within the root ball? Exactly or sheen? what I'm doing right yeah. here. Exactly what I'm doing right here. And again, you know, every time I get through this mass of organic, I hit these soil particles that even though this tree's been in this container for almost 10 years, there are still impact, in, intact particles of akadama. There are intact particles of pumice and lava. And this is that quote unquote friable, friable soil in the horticultural term. I mean, Jesus, can you kind of focus on this area here and we can just see the intact nature of the particles here? Okay, I mean, there's solid Akadama particles still intact, not a lot of them. This is, the roots have scaled the Akadama very well, which is what's led to the needle reduction and an intense amount of fine branching inside of this tree, right? But the fact that I'm down to that means I've gotten through, and you'll see, hey, stay in tight with me here, you'll see this really dense black mass that I'm kind of working through. You see the roots that are kind of forming in that. I want to get through this black mass to be able to get to that friable intact soil, and that's how we get water back into the root system, because that friable soil opens up the space for water and oxygen movement to occur. What I'm assuming I'm gonna see when we flip this over is I'm assuming a majority of the core of this root system is gonna be still field soil, and that's really what we have to tackle in the second potting. We've already dealt with the limitations to getting it into the container in the first potting. We got it into a beautifully sized container that allowed us to build a really fine scaled root system for the tree. That's what's led to the short needles and the really highly refined shape. If we want this tree to continue to perpetuate itself, now we've got to come back in and take that second step. And knowing this second step is what allows you guys to believe in the Mariah approach to the first step, right? So if you know, okay, we leave some portion untouched, we don't bear root, and this is what we're gonna come back in and do, not necessarily 10 years later, but four, three, four, five years later, we're gonna come back in and perform this operation, expose this nabari, get down to friable soil, leave this intact and come back into that core and pull out that field soil, then you can really buy into the information that we're, that we're so, sort of sharing with you guys. And I think it's important. I think it's important as a teacher to be able to show you, hey, this works, and these are the techniques from start to finish, right? From that first potting and handling and reduction of our greatest limitation into the container that we want, build the root system with the soil at scales. This is why we use these components, balance water and oxygen. We get here, now we leave that intact, that root system we've constructed, we come back into the core, we pull out all of that organic material and field soil, fill it with domesticated soil in 10 more years. That's gonna be a dense root system and this tree's gonna to continue to climb in its refinement. Uh, Rafi says one point that he took from the podcast is that some organic and the substrate like composted pine bark might be beneficial. What do you think about that? Um, so again, you have to understand that this is not somebody that does bonsai that's saying these things, right? So him saying that pine bark would be good, he's not dealing with a, a gravity column that's this shallow, where a limited amount of gravity moving water out of that. Pine bark will decompose, it will hold water, it will clog oxygen spaces. There's not enough gravity to pull water out of it and it will suffer, it will, the tree will suffer, I promise it will suffer. Or you'll have to repot it before you get this kind of density, right? And it's always the risk when we put out that information because scientifically, Ian is brilliant, brilliant, and his ideas have applicability, but as a bonsai practitioner, we can't say, oh man, Ian said do this, so we gotta do this. He's never done bonsai in his life, right? But he knows microbial activity. He knows how there are some ways that we could cause the right kind of hormonal release with the right kind of microbial fungi and bacteria balances in our container. That's what matters. Those are the points that matter. Not that he suggested using pine bark. That doesn't, that's not, we're already past that. We've already evolved way past that. We know why we don't do it. We see why we don't do it, right? We know what our goals are. So just be careful, very much buffer. As, as bonsai practitioners, we all have to be filters for the information that comes through sort of our cranium in the practice of this art form, be, be discretionary in the way that you take on knowledge and information and apply it to your practice. Oh, using the pine bark to start it in, in terms of, uh, oh, I got you. So Ian was, Lime was saying that, uh, that he thinks Ian was saying using the pine bark to start it, but not using it in the container. So to start the fungus, and then take the inoculum and use that. What's up, bud? Oh, 
Wow, this is crazy, crazy root development. Um, so David wants to know, how would you improve the transition from the bark to the roots? Because there seems to be like an undercut, undercutting. Yeah, just give us time. Give us time. <laughs> give us time. Everybody, everybody's getting excited. Just give us time, right? The process <laughs> will play out. Again, this is, this is a... This is a process, we've, we've created something, we've built something, now we're kind of exploring it, right? You have to, there isn't, there is no repot. Troy and I were talking about this and, uh, and then my Juniper um, 3 class was talking about this. You could, you could document every repot that we do at Mirai because not a single one is exactly the same. And so when we're in this situation, I'm just kind of working with it, right? I'm not worried about that. I see that it exists. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. Let's just worry about getting this organic stuff off down to friable soil. That's my focus right now. That's all I'm focused on. If we try to do everything at once, we don't get anything done. That's my... Can you try and work from the other side? I can, but I'm going to have to uh, shift the position of the tree. Yeah, we just put the tree Okay, I gotcha. Gotcha, gotcha. How is that? Better? Better. Okay, cool. You got it. I'm going to pull this off now so we can get up into some of this mojo. Start to see that beautiful base. Losing some lichen. That's, lichen is great. It's not what we're repotting to preserve. We're trying to open up this root mass. Okay, and you'll notice how many roots I'm cutting that are on the surface of this here. I'm just getting rid of all of this, all of the stuff that is accumulated in this decomposing organic. And you have to think, if you're a root and you're looking for water, oxygen, and nutrition with that top dressing and that formation, this is exactly what we're cultivating with that moss on the surface, is that surface product of roots. Now we've taken this down almost two inches now, and this is why we start with this. Because when we begin the repot, having seen how far above that, that container, that soil mass has grown and accumulated, Accumulated, we sometimes lose, lose track of the fact that there is a lot that exists underneath that that is beneficial to the aesthetic of the tree. So we've got to kind of reorient from the beginning. Uh, Andy wants to know if you note the date of repotting for a tree or is it all memory? Everything about the trees at Mariah is through memory. That's what I thought. That's yeah. what I told some other folks in the chat. <laughs> yeah, I, I uh, you know, I don't remember a lot. My team, <laughs> my team will uh, probably attest to that, but I do very rarely forget a tree. And the timing, you know, the, the, the structure of the roots, the challenges in the repot, I, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, the focus of bonsai demands that you pay close attention to what you're doing with a tree when you're working on it. It's a very intimate experience, and uh, this is one of those things that I just don't, for I don't forget. I, 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 you know, even with Mr. Kimura, he would say, how do you, how do you remember this stuff? And it just, it, just, it just was for me, I don't know. Uh, Mike wants to know, following up on permeability, do you ever work a chopstick into the soil to make holes in the dense mass on a tree that you're not repotting? No, that actually decreases permeability because when I take this chopstick and I force it through here, the displacement of that soil from that tip is compressed into the wall so hard that there's no way that anything is going to actually move into the root mass. It creates a worse situation. The way that we increase permeability is we come through and we clean off the surface exactly as we're doing here, right? Now this has been done twice with this tree. You can see how much has reaccumulated to get down to the structural roots that are forming the information on the base of this tree. So this is a perfect thing to get to show you guys and go through because you start to understand, oh, that, that, that actually is what it's supposed to look like. This is how we go about sort of reducing that and getting back to a scenario where the tree can get water through that system. He's stopping after he gets through the massive amount of organic material when he starts to see the akadama and pumice in those intact scenarios and shapes where it's not totally broken down. And by getting back to that, he's going to have the ability to get water in. Oh, okay. All right. That's what I want you guys to take from this. Where am I stopping? Where am I using sort of the indicators in the soil? And what are those indicators to tell me that I've gone far enough 
and that I'm making sure I'm real aware of the design of the tree because there's a beautiful base that's formed over here that was completely lost in the design of the tree for two or three years as that accumulated on top of it from the last time we cleaned off the surface. Every time we come back in, we have to make sure water and oxygen can get into this core. This is the first step before we ever go to the bottom of the root mass. Uh, Kim asks if you worry about scratching the roots with the chopstick. Nope, I don't, and here's why. Number one, I'm using a sharp chopstick, but number two, as I'm working through here, you'll notice anything that's damaged on the surface, and again, please, please, please separate the idea that this is a routine repot. This isn't a routine repot, this is the second repotting of a ponderosa pine, and again, the knowledge is specific to that sort of formality of what are we doing in this practice that is the totality of handling roots at Mirai. In the second repotting, I know I wanna leave the exterior roots I've built intact, they're very compressed, I've gotta get water and oxygen through and uncover the base, okay? But my priority is gonna be to go into the core where I have that broken down mountain soil and I pull that out and replace it with that aggregate, beautiful domesticated soil that's built everything that you see on the exterior here, okay? So when I'm working this, any damaged roots that I'm forming, because I've already built that really dense mass outside of this, I'm happily just cutting those off cleanly at the surface. And you, you, get, you can see how clean the surface of my root mass is right here. There aren't roots hanging out everywhere. Every time that I work it, I come back and I cleanly prune them and then I go back to working again just to get down to that really beautiful, intact, friable soil as my indicator for where I stop, okay? So damaging the roots is going to happen if you're going to work down to that appropriate depth in the container. Those are the roots that we're cleanly pruning, sculpting the root mass, and we know that this isn't damaging very much because we've built such a solid core of roots, okay? If this were a first repot and we were just trying to fit this into a container and we didn't have as many fine roots and we hadn't built that that domesticated soil, then we would be a lot more careful with the handling of these surface roots. But this repot, because we've already built so much, I'm very comfortable with how we're going about this. Okay. Um, Gary wants to know if you could use a bristle brush in addition to the chopstick. Um, <clears throat> a bristle brush would do Boy, I feel like it would get clogged with all of the gunk that we're kind of teasing out of the root system, to be honest with you. I've never, never thought about using a bristle brush. I'm gonna go ahead and just set these blocks down because the tree is now standing up on its own and that way you guys can see a little bit better. Um, I don't know. I don't know if a bristle brush would be usable in all, in all honesty. I've never, it's never, thoughts never crossed my mind. And then Eric wants to know if you're worried about rubbing off the bark where the wood blocks are. Um, he lost a ton of bark on his Scots pine last year. Um, not if it's sitting right at a, a nice horizontal surface and it's got the tree held tightly. If the tree is sitting there bouncing and rubbing on it, and I'm also being very careful. I mean, if you guys watch how I'm, how I'm working this root system, the tree isn't bouncing around the table at all, right? This is where your supporting hand should always be working to support and make sure that the tree isn't suffering from the operation. A lot of times what happens is when we start to get too myopically, you know, we really get focused on this and we're just, we're just, I gotta get this root system right here, right? When we do that, we start to forget about the rest of the tree and that's when the bark will suffer. So no, I don't worry about it, but the, the lack of worry comes from the awareness of sort of the totality of the situation that I'm engaging in. Um, Paul wants to know if the buds on this tree have started to swell or push, or is the tree still in dormancy? Um, they have just started to take on a caramel tone through their dormant winter sort of white, white crusted phase. And so yes, the, the trees at Mirai are officially starting to become active. Now it's interesting, um, and let me just show you this uh, to the camera here. So as I'm working and I'm dealing in this really compressed soil, you'll notice that I get this rounded blunt tip on my chopstick. Once I get to that point, that chopstick is now retired until it can be sharpened. I come back to a nice sharp chopstick again. Now what I am dealing with and what's interesting about seeing the buds swell is I'm actually dealing with a little bit of a solid uh, frozen root mass right in here around the base. And that's not necessarily 
ideal. We'll hope that that's not permeating the core of the tree. This is definitely the portion of the pot that was facing the north side. Um, so we'll see how that goes when we get into the core. But it was 24 degrees last night. This tree was outside. So to see it moving out of winter dormancy as triggered by ambient daytime temperatures and, and also that daylight length increasing is uh, trees are starting to become active regardless of the fact that we are experiencing still very significant winter conditions in the Pacific Northwest. So it's kind of, kind of interesting to observe just all parts of the dormant phase because a tree long before it ever starts to grow will already be active and that activity is triggered by temperature and daylight length. Still very, very uh, durable to cold. 24 degrees is really nothing for a ponderosa pine. Like they don't even, they don't even acknowledge that that's cold. Uh, it probably feels good to them. <coughs> Um, so following up on Paul's question, he asked because he wanted to know uh, what you think of Dennis Votia's idea um, about cutting back to one bud instead of two on deciduous trees for better movement. Does that apply to ponderosas as well? Um, well, so does it apply to ponderosas? Man, cutting back to one bud instead of two on a deciduous tree is to say that you're cutting back to a bud that is then going to grow in that direction. If you cut a ponderosa pine back like a deciduous tree, your needles would skyrocket, you'd never develop any back budding, you'd never develop any ramification. Their, their behavior, conifer, deciduous, pine versus you know, maple or whatever he was uh, approaching that with, so different it's not even the same, not even in the same realm of consideration. There's, no, there's really no crossover applicability to that in my mind. Okay. Um... Leonard, back to Leonard's question. So he was talking about potting in a smaller vessel for shortening the needles. He wants to know if that is a viable way to shorten the needles further, to, to pot in a smaller pot. Um, I mean, I think that your, your, container, your container decisions have to be twofold. Does the tree look good and does it function? Can you keep it alive? Can you keep it healthy? And does it constrict the environment enough? Right? So can you keep it alive, watered, and healthy with the care you can give it? Is it big enough to support basically you not being around? Right? But on the other side of the small side, uh, does it constrict enough to give you confined growth that is bone -siable, Right? Um, and you can go too far on both sides. You can go too big and never be able to refine the tree. You can go too small and have to work so hard just to keep it alive that it's a problem, right? And we don't even get to enjoy the aesthetics of it because you're just like, geez, I can't keep this tree watered. It's always struggling. It's highly disease susceptible, et cetera, et cetera. So that balance in there is, is sort of that aesthetic. Does it look good? Does it physically hold the tree? Um, and then those functions. And I think the container for this tree is the right constriction of it for the size of the tree with the foliage mass that's been created um, combined with the right function of the tree to be able to water it and keep it healthy. Okay. All right. So this, this is really, really beautiful. I'm very, very happy with how this uh, root system is, has been created and really compressed and compacted, extremely dense. Now we get to see, and let me just go ahead and show Jesus over here so you guys can see. Take a look at the base of this Nabari that we've just uncovered on this tree. I mean, this is really outstanding development and evolution from the tree's first repotting. I mean, I... I know that there were roots over here and I know that they were bigger than roots anywhere else, but they were not that. That is really special, the development that's taken place over here. This is kind of thawing out here where I initially started, so I'll just pull this back just a little bit more. We'll have a little bit of work to do here as this kind of thaws out, but that is just magic. That's exactly what we're striving for, okay? So now I'm gonna switch. Now that we've got the surface worked, everything looks really nice. We've got everything cleanly pruned. We never wanna move on and leave this just a tattered mess keep up with the pruning process and keeping the cleanliness in it. Now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna shift to the bottom of the tree's root mass so that we can actually dig in. Knowing what we know from the top, we can actually dig into the process of um, exposing this open bottom piece. And this is where it might get a little jarring for you guys, um, but you need to know how to execute this technique to be able to get through such a compressed bottom mass of roots. Okay, so I'm gonna come back to my handy dandy paint scraper. Okay, and I'm just gonna mark just a layer that gets me through that bottom compressed mat of roots. Okay, and I wanna maintain the same angle. I'm not changing the design of the tree. So I'm gonna go ahead and just sort of give myself a reference so that I can see where I'm on that line, maintaining the angle and the design of the tree and eliminating that bottom piece. And now I'm gonna get through it. 
Okay, I'm actually gonna go into that root mass and really kind of get through that root mass, maintaining that line. Okay, and this is where I say it's a little jarring because a lot of people have a hard time going this hard. Oh my gosh, you're gonna hurt your tree. No, it's not. You have to get through this root mass in a repot. You cannot leave this bottom mat intact. Look at how thick that is. That is solid, solid root right there. There's no soil in this. There's nothing that is solid. Look at that as I splay that apart. Can you see that, Jesus? That is insanity. That is craziness, okay? This is what it looks like to truly get a root system to compress. You push so many roots into that small container that there is nowhere for them to go and they just start to create roots. Now notice what I'm seeing as I get into the core of this here. I'm seeing intact Akadama particles and really beautiful little tiny fine roots everywhere. This is that root system that we're trying to build in the process of creating a bonsai in this confined environment. Um, Keegan wanted to know what the white stuff is on the bottom of that root mat. That's, that is your fungi. Ah. That is your fungi right there. Right, that's your microbial relationship. That's the fungi. And where that connects to the roots is where mycorrhiza is taking place. Mycorrhiza being the marriage or the relationship of this fuzzy fungi with the root system to expand its surface area for water and nutrient uptake to protect it from disease and pest and all of those things, okay? Notice too, root tips are white. Just starting to really start to grow, starting to take in water, which is where we see the bud, also showing that white color in the bud at the tip of the branch, reflecting directly what's happening in the root system. Pretty magical to get to see all of these indicators sort of taking place together. Okay, right? Huh. So there is the bottom of the root mass on a tree that has been in a container long enough to compress the soil system and really start to create a beautiful compressed root ball worthy of bonsai activity, right? We have to get this created, okay? This is an important part of the root system creation. If we're not creating this, we're not leaving the tree in the system long enough. This is what leads to the choice of Akadama pumice lava and a high quality Akadama that doesn't decompose on its own, but takes the scalability or the work of the roots to break down, okay? And once we get into this and we start to see this scenario, and I'm gonna change my leverage here so that I just have a little bit more relief from my arms. Now I wanna to start to come back in and just open up the core of this and really start to explore. Do I have areas of really sort of black, dark pockets of, of, of field soil? Do I have healthy roots through and through? And regardless, if I take off enough in that first swath, and again, I only wanna take off that matted section and the matted section on this, was almost an inch thick, so it, it, it's, that's what it took. But I only wanna take off that matted section for that first go, and then come back with chopsticks to do the rest of any reduction or feeling out process. But these are the areas, here we go. This is what I wanted to see, okay? Notice how I get into this really black field soil right here. Let me just open this up. Ah, yikes, really black, broken down field soil. Okay, now let me prune the roots just, to, just so that you guys can kind of get into this with me and start to see what I'm dealing with here. Let me, let me sort of clean this out for you. Okay, and the reason that this is bad is because, and what you'll notice is as I work this area that has this really dark, mucky mountain soil in it, there are very few fine roots that exist in this. All of my fine roots are growing in the Akadama that existed on the bottom of the container, but they're not growing inside of this mucky, mucky system right here. So as I get into this and I start to see this, I'm gonna open this up and this is my focus. I wanna take all of this stuff out of the core that's not producing all of those fine roots. And this is where I trade out 
Now I've built up this exterior root mass and you will have to come back and go through this. I'm gonna leave that exterior after I take away the matted roots. I'm gonna leave it relatively intact. I'm gonna come back into this interior and I'm gonna take out this interior where all of this garbage that's not, notice how few roots are existing in here, okay? That makes no sense at all. Let me just get myself a prop here because she's getting a little heavy. Makes no sense at all to not have any root growth after this has been compressed for so long. Okay, so I wanna be coming back in here and just cleaning that out and my goal is to, to replace this with really beautiful, friable soil that's gonna give me a balance of water and oxygen. Now you guys should be asking yourselves, how far back do you reduce then? How do you know when to stop? That is the question that we always ask ourselves to create our sort of guideposts for our behavior inside of this root system. I'm gonna stop when I start to encounter a location where the akadama is intact and really beautifully creating that root system because I know the whole thing isn't this decomposing soil. I know that there are pockets of it that I left untouched that I didn't bear root in that first repotting and now those pockets that were untouched and I didn't bear, re, uh, dirt, bear root in that first repotting, I'm addressing in the second right now. And let me just go ahead and rotate this so that I can get a little more perspective from Eve. Okay, how's that Eve? Can you see in there? Yeah. Wow. Wow. And what's gonna happen, and why, why I focused so much on the surface in the beginning was one, to uncover the nabari. But what's gonna happen is I'm gonna be taking this out and I'm probably gonna pop out of the surface and I'm gonna end up with a ring of roots around this that I actually have established and I'm gonna take out those pockets all the way up through the surface of that root mass. So when I work that down, I create a much more friendly environment to work through it instead of trying to work through it and then cleaning off the surface of the soil. And it sort of goes in two parts in, in terms of that scope and style and timing of work to be able to effectively perform this operation. Now I'm gonna be fairly diligent about removing as much of this as I possibly can while I'm in here because I'm, I'm not gonna be in here for another six, seven, eight, nine years probably. So anywhere where I've got all of this garbage sitting inside of this root system. I wanna take all of it out as much as I can possibly get because I know I'm not gonna be taking apart the exterior ring of the root system right here. You have any questions for me, Sam? I got plenty. Yeah, let's rock and um, roll. So Mel wants to know what happens to all the used potting mix. Uh, it goes into my vegetable garden. Nice. Um, and then let me just make sure I'm copying all the new questions. One sec. Okay. Um, Diane wants to know when the two previous cleanings of the organics and topsoil happened on this tree, was it left in the pot? What? Oh, uh, off of the surface? Yeah. Yeah. So we cleaned it, we vacuumed it off, and then we retop dressed and started fertilizing again. Yeah. And you can see that process uh, as the surface treatment on the dug fur. I forget what that feature content is called, but uh, that's a perfect example of needing, needing that work and how we, how we perform that scope of work. Okay. Um, Paul wants to know if this tree will need to be protected from cold after this repotting. Uh, most definitely. Yeah, most definitely. Okay, uh, and then Andrew wants to know, since the root ball is so dense, will you be able to get new soil into the middle? Um, Andrew finds himself often repotting and only getting soil around the perimeter of the root ball, and then it causes drainage issues and the middle is still dry. Well, so Andrew, this is why you guys are watching Mariah Live, because I'm going to show you how to fix that tonight. Yes. I am going to show you how to fix that problem. I would be willing to bet that that's a problem 90% of people that are watching have, and that's an understandable problem to have, but we need to make sure that we don't have that problem. That's the goal, is to make sure that we create a scenario where we've got a lot more uh, friendly penetration of water and oxygen. That's why it's so important to have the surface worked, because as I'm sort of chipping away in here, I'm getting closer and closer to a point where there it is, right? My chopstick pops out of the surface. And this is imperative. When we come back in 
and we work out this core. We have to work the core out to the surface so that we can use that hole and that access point in the surface to fill the interior with that really beautiful or, uh, aggregate soil that we're gonna be utilizing, okay? So I'm just gonna continue to kind of use that and expand that. That's gonna be a soil entry site. There's probably gonna be multiple places where we pop out like that and have those entry points as we continue to kind of work through this. But I'm, I'm not even close to done. You can see how much, you can just see how much black, I mean, and how black that is. I mean, that is really, really dense dark field soil that's existing there. There's some pumice that's coming out with it. I mean, if I press it, it literally mounds up into a ball. I mean, it turns into a ball of mud. I gotta get that out if I want root growth inside of that container, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and just continue to work. So Eric wants to know if, if most of the trees that you worked on in Japan were this compact in the roots. Um, so the ones, and this is the interesting thing, I think that's a really astute question. Um, in Japan, a lot of the trees had already gone through the process of having the sheen changed out so that they had the, the core of the root system had been worked, the exterior had been worked. And what you get when you have that healthy sheen, when you go and repot, you clean off the surface, you clean off the sides, you clean off the bottom, you go right back into the container and you never really touch the core of that tree once you establish it. This is that sheen. And we've talked about the sheen a lot, but now you're getting to see where I'm taking out that soil and I'm gonna, I'm gonna be effectively building the sheen from this point moving forward. J Japanese trees have a sheen constructed and that's what gives them their density, their ramification, their tight needles, that ma mature look that we've always strived for. We never knew what that meant and how it was associated with the sheen of the tree until you know, we started really working this. So getting to share the second potting with you guys you have enough examples of the first potting of a juniper, of a ponderosa pine. You've seen it so many times. Removal of greatest limitation into a container that gives us that constriction and aesthetic quality of a bonsai. Now the second potting is what allows you to deal with the building of that sheen and the removal of all of that remaining field soil. Uh, Oliver wants to know if you can use a comma instead of a paint scraper to remove the root mat. You could, you could. Um, Generally, a comma doesn't allow you to take off that really nice sheet because you'll kind of get here and then you'll have to start getting in here. And I really want to keep that angle of that tree perfect if I've already set it and I've established it. And that's where the paint scraper allows me to just drive that straight down and we get that uniform thickness and we maintain that angle and that's why it's an effective tool. There are other tools you can use for sure. It just doesn't allow you to maintain that kind of accuracy. All right, and then Rafi said when you were cutting the root mat, he didn't remember seeing you pull the galvanized wire from the top. Did you remove the wire or is it? No, it's still in here. Okay. Yeah, just... no, I've just cut it. I've cut it as oh, I've confronted it. it. You okay. know, and this is where I don't need to pull that wire out. Like there's nothing in the repotting process that's like, oh man, if you don't get that galvanized wire out, that tree is gonna die. There's, there's no... There's no real impact that that wire has. So I just cut it. I never pull the wire out. There's no reason to. Cool. Um, so. Oh man, look at that. Look at that hole that, and, and then notice, notice how this is still real compact out here. And Jesus kind of come right in here where I'm working. Cause this is, we're starting to get to one of those points where I can show that dramatic transition of the, of the bottom of the root mass. Let me just get some of these roots out of the way here. Okay. So now how far do we take this core out? Well, as I get into this black and I start getting through that layer of field soil right there, notice how I start to encounter friable, intact Akadama right there. Notice how I break through the black and now I'm into a wall of established fine roots and really beautiful Akadama right there. That's where I stop because I don't want to break up this outer root mass. That's what I'm leaving as my untouched portion that's never going to be bare rooted this second repotting process, right? So coming in and taking out all of this garbage garbage to the point where I get that really compact root system that's scaled with the Akadama and given me that refinement. This is the crux. This is the piece of knowledge that you guys have to have to do this operation well. And I'm glad that we're getting there so that you guys get to see that. All right. So this is kind of a involved 
repotting question from Paul. Um, Paul read an article, um, and in this article, the author said that in some trees, the vast majority of energy is stored in the roots. Um, if we remove 30% of the roots prior to repotting, aren't we removing 30% of the stored energy? Prior to repotting? Yes. If we were well, like during repotting, oh, I during guess. Repotting. And then, okay. um, and then the other part of the question is once uh, shoot extension is finished and all the energy utilized, new roots begin to form and energy resupply begins. So would it be better to repot when shoot extension stops? Um, so you're also dealing with what are the what are the climactic issues that are impacting the tree at that point in time, right? Um, we're talking about shorter temperature. We're talking about maximum stored energy right now. When it pushes out all those shoots and you start to recover that energy, are you going to have the same amount of stored energy? No, you're not. Not until the end of fall uh, this year, right? And so. Should you wait until then? No, because you're dealing with far less energy at a time where you have far more factors pulling water out of the foliage mass of the tree while you impact the roots that are supplying that foliage mass. You, you shut down all of the systems. It doesn't make any sense. Now, are the, is the energy stored in the roots? Uh, for a lot of species, yes, and particularly for a pine, which is why you're seeing such coarse, big, thick, fleshy roots. I mean, these are not small roots. This is where a pine strength comes from the roots. It's also why they lean so heavily on the microbial activity and the relationship that is defined as mycorrhiza, right? So when we do this repotting, are we going to see a difference in the growth this year? Absolutely. You should plan on that. You're going to see a weaker amount of growth because you're taking away some of the stored resources. This is why we need to have the needle mass on the tree built up every time we repot. Now, an established tree has a lot more ramification, has a lot more needle count, has a lot more density. That's why it can endure this kind of operation. In a raw tree, that's why we build them up to get that strong before we ever repot. In a field-grown tree, it's why we repot the root system first before we remove all of that needle count. And so you start to see that theory proving out to afford the tree the ability to recuperate the energy when you remove those stored resources that exist in the root system. Um, Thomas asks, if you have bad Akadama, what do you do with it? Can you still utilize it? And if it's poor, can you refire it? Um, so firing, fired Akadama is a different thing, right? You, the, 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 this is one of the unfortunate sort of commercial maneuvers in Japan. Akadama is not fired. Uh, even the Akadama that says it's fired is not fired. Because if it's fired, it's no longer beige. It turns bright pink, like a terracotta orange or a really bright salmon pink. And it no longer behaves in the scalability format like the Akadama that we value and use in bonsai. Um, if you have bad Akadama, what do you do with it? Use it in your veggie garden, use it in a potted house plant, or use it in a tree that's only going to be in the container for a year or two. You're trying to grow out a deciduous tree, you're using a colander with a maximum amount of oxygen. That's a perfect place for lower quality Akadama. But when you go into a container for six to eight years to get this dense root system in this refined old Yamadori tree, you got to go with high quality. That's what you're after. You need that longevity. You need that active decomposition from root action. You can't have that passive breakdown of Akadama from the wet, dry cycle in the bonsai container, or it will never last six to eight years to get this kind of dense root system. Michael wants to know why we would not use a shop vac here. Because I'm going to flip it over and all of this is going to fall out. So I'm not really super concerned necessarily about that. And also, inside of this, this is all really tightly compact and, and, and sort of tied together. A shop vac isn't going to remove this. This is just sort of elbow grease and really slow uh, due diligence that we're paying to the root system to be able to make the moves and tease out the soil where it, where it exists and where it can be improved to really elevate the level and the health of our root system. Now, you guys can see, I mean, my whole hand fits in here now. I've broken through the surface in three different locations where I've removed it all the way up to the surface. This is the work, this is the work. There's no easy way to go about it. You just gotta get dirty and you gotta take it to it. Being very smart, you'll notice that the, the, the big roots here, these are structural roots. Can we see these? Are we there, Josh? Okay. These big structural roots are connecting to these fine roots on the exterior. There are no fine roots growing off of these into this core, which is why the core is falling apart. And so when we put that 
Akadama pumice lava mix back into this core after we're done with this, these will start to produce fine roots that will cause this to solidify and become that epicenter of health and that epicenter of refinement in the tree. And that's why this action in the second repot is so important. I cannot, I cannot, I literally cannot stress enough how big of a deal this repot is for your bonsai cultivation to get them to a point where they're gonna be really, really highly refinable trees. So this question was from Leonard and it was from a bit ago, so I'm not exactly sure what area he's talking about, but he asked if you could apply a growth enzyme to the area to promote new root growth. Oh, I just need to put balance of water and oxygen with good soil mix and all the root growth that could ever take place will naturally take place. And this is again, be careful to think that there is a solution that is better than a balance of water and oxygen. No, no matter what inoculant or compost tea or fungal relationship you can create, if you don't have water and oxygen, you're not gonna be able to cultivate a healthy tree inside of the confined shallow environment of the bonsai container. And that's really where, even though there are no roots here, there will be roots there when we make that balance of water and oxygen function. And pines are very good. They're very good at producing roots from their very, really thick fleshy tissue of their storage roots or their structural roots. We will see this completely occupied by uh, fine roots that are produced from these big thick fleshy roots. And the only reason there aren't fine roots in here is because the tree said, oh man, that Akadama pumice and lava is a better balance of water and oxygen and has a higher uh, nutrient retention capacity for me to access. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold the structure here. I'm going to pump all my energy into fine root production there. Akadama scales it. Water is available. Nutrition's there. Oxygen's there. And the tree says, boom, 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 boom. Root growth, root growth, root growth. That's the spot. Um, let's see here. Paul wants to know if there is a sheen in this tree. No, I'm, I'm, I am doing the work right now to set the tree up to be able to build that sheen. And again, when we deal with a tree in that first potting to get it into a bonsai pot and start the root, the root process of development in the Mirai fashion, right? We build the exteriors, we leave some portion bare, uh, untouched and we never bear root. The untouched never bear root part in the first potting is what's being pulled out now. When I replace this with Akadama pumice and lava and I get those roots to scale and I get that healthy system in this core, that will be my sheen. So this is really the work that has to happen because in that first repot, you can't take all of this out. You would never get that tree into a bonsai container and any root you built outside of this area would be outside of the confines of the pot this tree will ever fit into. It's why we take this process and these steps to get to this point. So by cultivating this, now we replace this. Now in two repottings, We've completely rectified the root system and it's the size that we want for the tree as the tree's been developing and accommodating the root system to be balanced in that relationship, right? So this is a really, it's a really beautiful marriage of technique and aesthetics and the, the strategy to being able to actualize this is exactly what I'm sharing with you. This is the piece that you haven't had yet. This is the piece that everybody needed to know, okay, we believe you, Ryan, but what about that field soil or that mountain soil that still remains? Boom, this is what we do with it. Uh, Mike wants to know what your thoughts are on the half bare root technique, then coming back to bare root the other half a year or two later. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question because naturally now you're starting to say, okay, cool. So I see how you're doing this. Other professionals handle it by bare rooting half of it coming back two years later and bare rooting the other half. Here's the problem with that. Ultimately, when you bare root one half, you put it in a container, you let it grow, you haven't touched the other half. So naturally that container is probably much larger than the container you want for that tree. Now you come back two years later, you bare root the other half and you let it recover. Now you've had to leave the half you bare rooted two years earlier intact. So it's still in that too large of a container. So four years later, now you have a root system in a container that's too large for the tree that's been growing and producing coarse growth over four years of development in the tree because it's too large for the size of that tree. You have to come back in, you've got to cut off roots and you've got to start your re refinement process but you're four years down the road. Why not start that process the first time you repot it, doing the work to get it into that container, leaving that portion untouched, going ahead and using that container to refine the growth, create usable growth, have that aesthetic, and then come back a second repot when the tree is ready for it, remove that core, 
and all of a sudden the focus has been on the aesthetic of the tree, the refinement of the tree, and the development of the root system. I'm so far past bare root half one year, two years later, bare root the other half, four years later, let's start thinking about refining the shape and finding a container that works for this tree that we're gonna have to heavily reduce this root system. It doesn't make sense to me. That process doesn't make sense. You can do this just by being considerate of how we handle the roots, and this is that second step. Paul wants to know if you ever put raffia on old bark if you have to grab it. No. All right. Um, Thomas wants to know, is your paint scraper super sharp or yes. is it dull? It is super, super sharp. sharp. Super sharp. Cool. Um, David asks or says, in spite of the long period of time since the last repotting and all the field soil, the tree doesn't seem to show any ill effects nope. or do you, you don't see any ill effects? Doesn't show any ill effects, which is why we kept pushing it. And that was kind of what I said in the beginning. Look, if this tree had shown disease susceptibility, if this tree had had problems with balance of water and oxygen, if it had yellowing, if it had random branch dieback, any of the indicators that we've got an imbalance of water and oxygen and we're getting decomposition or really having problems in the root system, we would have had to have done this earlier on. But because it never showed those indications, we were just like, well, let's just keep pushing it. Let's see, let's see what the limit is, right? Let's see where that outer limit is. It got to a point where water absolutely could not get through the, the soil mass into the root system. And we were just like, we're, we're getting to a point now where with that lack of percolation, we're asking for trouble. Now we're coming back and we're going ahead and tackling this. So on the topic of bare rooting, Leonard asks, so are you saying that when we receive a tree that has been bare rooted for shipment, we're starting from square one to this whole process? Oh, big time. Uh, and then Michael wants to know, are you leaving those coarse roots on the bottom? You leaving Absolutely. Them there? Absolutely, because they're connected to the fine roots that are supporting this tree, right? And so I know this isn't a deciduous tree where we come in and we cut all the coarse roots off the bottom. It's not what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with a conifer, okay? And so we've got to improve the soil situation. These structural roots connect to the fine roots that are feeding this foliage mass with water and with nutrition. So we've got to make sure and be gentle as we work around those. Those are important roots in terms of the total strategy and structure of the containerized environment right now. So I'm just kind of working with in this, trying to work around them, trying to be gentle of them. I'm cutting back a lot of the finer roots in here that are kind of overlapping and just hanging like a, you know, like a bad afro or something, uh, dreadlocks in the middle of the container. I'm getting those out of there so that they don't stop the ability to continue moving and I'm cleaning up any damage. Any damage that's performed to these roots, I've got to clean that up. That tip has to be a clean cut to compartmentalize and produce new roots from it. And that's where you see me occasionally come back in and I'll come back and prune real nice and clean. Just get a really nice clean cut site for new roots to be produced from those areas. But all in all, as we're working this, there aren't a whole lot of roots that I'm cutting in here because most of the roots are focused on the exterior of this root mass. And you can really see now just how dramatic this is. Every time I show this to somebody, every time we do this in class, you know, it's a real eye opener to students because, I mean, we literally go back in and we take out every single piece of soil that was left in the first repot. We come back in and we take every piece out because it's not providing root growth. Grayson wants to know, for subsequent repottings when there is no remaining field soil, is the section you leave untouched alternated or does it depend on what you're seeing in the health of the tree? Um, so if we, if we create, there's a fifth hole right there, right through the bottom, all the way through the surface, right? So I'm getting all of those areas to be able to insert that soil, okay? Using a good Akadama pumice lava, high quality inside of this, it scales, it's set up for success. We have that set up on the exterior here. Successive repotting, surface, matted roots on the side, matted roots on the bottom. Checking to make sure there's no black areas, no rotting areas, no structural issues or balance of water and oxygen issues in the root system. But for 20, 30 years, we're probably never going to have to change out this core after we do this. And that's the beautiful part about it. So when you see imported trees come in from Japan, the first thing, you know, back in the day, these white pine would come in from Japan and people would say, oh, you got to get in there and you got to break up that, that, that root mass or else it's going gonna, it's gonna to have problems. Actually, that was the sheen and the portion that we should have never broken up. 
And when people went in and started using coarser granules, the wrong soil compositions, they handled the roots and watered them inappropriately, that sheen and that core that had been built did start to suffer and did become the problem because the soil around it was not facilitating the environment that that sheen had been established to be able to exist within. But if we have this system and we understand particle size and composition and water application and fertilization and species of tree and nuances, we create that system, literally 20, 30 years, this will stay so healthy and lead to such a refined tree. Bonsai in North America, in Europe, in uh, the Western world, South Africa, Australia, has no clue how far we can push the refinement of our trees because we don't have this system set up for 20 or 30 years to see what that's capable of. But I guarantee you, the sky is the limit for our native material if we understand this step. Paul says, since we want to let ponderosas grow long to achieve reduced needle size, aside from the aesthetic, would it be better to let them grow in an Anderson tray until the needle length is achieved? No, because you can't get that in the needle. You can't get that in the uh, Anderson flat. You have to have the compression of the root system. You have to have the constriction of the bonsai pot and the, and the soil that exists there. Uh, and then Ed wants to know, should you be trimming the root mat along the outside as well? So we'll get to that. We're almost there. I'm basically all the way around. I'm to a point where I've got uh, a sort of all of these systems. Okay, now I need to be very, now that I'm here, right? And, and let me just go ahead and upright this. I'll dump all of this crap out so that there's no more garbage in there. And then we'll tilt it back to take a look at where we're at. So up we go. Ush. Okay, all of that crap comes out of there. Go ahead and get all this stuff off. Yes. Yes, okay, right? And basically what I've got here is I've got, I've got a hole here that allows me to tap into a majority of that core. Okay, I've got a hole here that allows me to tap into a large portion of that core. So I'm getting through on the surface here, just a little bit of field soil around here that I'm gonna knock out and just raise the size of that. Can you see what's happening there? Let me show this to Jesus, okay? So basically, I'm to a point where I've gotten through, I'm, I'm through this system, this whole underside here, everything inside of this ring. Now notice that this is solid, everything inside of this. So if I push on this, this is literally just a ring of roots right here. The inside is totally hollow throughout this. I need to have the ability to insert soil into all of those areas, right? So I need to make sure that I have those spaces in my root mass to be able to integrate soil into those roots and those spaces, okay? So I'm gonna create a number of spaces along the surface of the root mass. Let me go back upside down. Get that there. Okay, so now you can see really cleanly, you can see how big, hey Zeus, can you see that? Okay, see how big, you see daylight through there? I mean, I've literally removed all of the field soil that I possibly can get to. And I'm kind of coming in here and just doing a last touch up after we get all that garbage out. You still see a little bit of that matted organic. And that matted organic that still exists in there is not necessarily a deal breaker. Let's see if I can get through this. There we go. Yeah, I need to be able to, and this is where we come back. That matted organic is not necessarily a deal breaker in the small quantities it exists in because we remove so much of it. It'll be broken down into actual usable nutrition by the microbial activity, okay? But as I'm now looking in this, you'll notice these pockets, and inside of these pockets, go ahead and blast in right here, Jesus. We in there, Josh? Okay, so we've got these pockets and there are these high points in this pocket. Now I wanna be making, with my chopstick, I wanna be making a penetration through the surface of the soil at the high point of this pocket. So if this sort of slopes down here and slopes down here, my high point is here, I need to have the ability to insert soil through that area right there or else I won't be able to fill up that hole, okay? Now I've got plenty of access through the surface here Plenty of access through the surface here to take care of this pocket. And now I've got this hole here to be able to take care of this pocket. I want one more area right in here. I've got kind of a high point in this upper lip here. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna drive this guy and through this area. 
being real careful to not shoot through and damage the bark, okay, which I managed to touch anyways, okay, and I'm going to auger out a hole. Just notice how I'm just kind of moving that around, come back through the top here and just sort of widen out that hole, make that a little bit bigger, a little bit more of a contact point. And this is how we set ourselves up to be able to get soil into all of these different areas of the root system, okay? So I, I now have locations in each of these areas. Now on the other side of the root system, I want to mark those locations just to be sure. And my root mass is losing a lot of weight as I get all of this stuff out of there, which is why it's kind of starting to move on me. Okay, I want to make sure that I mark these areas so that I don't forget where these holes are. And I can't mark it with the fat side of my chopstick in the bottom because I'll never get it out. I actually need it the other way around. So let me go ahead and mark it with a thinner chopstick. This one seems to be the problem. Okay, there we go. All right, okay. And while I'm down here, now that I've gotten that taken care of, I'm gonna go ahead and make sure that the bottom of this root mass is nice and level to the design that I want. Okay, I need to get all of these and there's still some matted roots inside of here. Notice how, how thick and how dense these roots are right here. Still matted. Even though we took off that big mat, these are still matted up and I need to be careful as I work along these margins. But just getting through all of that root mass, I mean, geez, oh Pete, that is just insane. Insane amount of roots that existed in that exterior area, okay? You see I get through it and all of a sudden it starts to open up into real kind of ropey, real ropey matted roots and I can just come through and cleanly prune those off. I feel very comfortable cleanly pruning those, making sure that everything's nice and trimmed, clean. And go ahead and I'm gonna come back here You ready for some more questions? Give me just one second and let me kind of get through this section of it here. Okay. Goodness gracious. I mean, that's like, I, I, I haven't ever seen Ponderosa with that kind of bottom matted roots. It was clear it was healthy, but I didn't realize it was that healthy. And let me work right here and then we'll go, Sam. No worries. Okay. I need to feel comfortable with this because I'm not going to come back and do any more work to this. I want to be sure that I feel like, okay, yes, we have the bottom roots that are going to not be touched. We have those in a good situation so we don't have to worry about them and come back and deal with that again. Because once we work the sides of this, we're going to be at a point where we're not going to have the ability to lay this root system on its side again because we got to get these matted roots off of the side now. We're not going to be able to lay this down again. It's kind of, it kind of is where it is. And because we've got that hollow ring, we're not going to be able to come back in and lean on that hollow ring for stability any further beyond this point. So make sure that the bottom is really nice and to the degree that you want it to be. And notice that I'm still seeing those circling roots as I'm kind of in here working. I want to make sure that I've taken all of those out and I don't have circling roots along the bottom. Okay, that feels nice. These are all straight and nice. There's that mat on the exterior. We're gonna come and break that up. Okay, I feel pretty darn good about this. Okay, nice and clean. Everything's super nice and cleaned up. Feels good in here. Just get rid of a few of these little pieces. Not all of them. Okay. All right, coming back up. Sweetness. Okay, so now, now that we're here, the goal has to be to take this matted thick section off of the edge here 
without going into the root system so far that we break up this ring. And this is where we've got to be very, very careful, okay? So I want to get into this edge. I've got to get through these big, thick roots that are matted and sort of circling the root system here. But I don't want to bust up all of that solid root mass that I had in that system. There's a lot of coarse roots in here. There's a lot of roots that are circling the container in here. We're gonna go ahead and be pretty unforgiving with these because we've got that scaled fine root mass that exists inside of this. So this area here, still very beautiful roots, very scaled fine root mass that we have here. This is that last section of work that we've gotta do to be able to ensure that when we put this tree back in the container, it's got a little bit of space between the wall and the root system. We can't ever put matted roots back into the container. We've gotta make sure we've exposed new fresh roots. We've stopped that circling root system from continuing to form. Okay, and you can see that, matted, that mat of roots, we can't use those, okay? Let me show these to Jesus just so you guys can see this. I'm looking at that mat of roots right there that just came off of the root system. And you can see the big thick pieces circling the edge of the container. That's what we're taking off right there. Okay, so that's gotta come off of the sides as we continue to work here. So I'm just gonna work on this last little touch, really nice fine finesse touch here. This is where we show a lot of restraint. We don't go too hard because we know that there's only an inch of thickness in this ring right here. Okay, Sam, I'm ready. All right. Um, so, well, let's see, while you're doing this, we'll do, Michael wants to know why you don't use a paint scraper in this part of the process. Uh, because I don't have the stability in the root system since I've, I used that matted root system to hold together the piece while I augured out the center. Now I have to be very, uh, very careful and delicate because I don't have that center to support the use of the paint scraper on the exterior. So when we're repotting a tree, we have to be thinking about the sensitivity and the risk of bare rooting as we're repotting. We always have to be thinking, how am I gonna prevent bare rooting from occurring? How am I protecting this tree? How am I proactively taking action to ensure that this tree does not suffer from this operation. That's a priority that we've always got to take in when we're doing the repot. So in these instances, we have to know when do you push with force, what is our goal in the repotting process, and when do we need to execute finesse to actualize that goal. The force was on the bottom, the goal was to replace the sheen, we have to execute finesse on the exterior because we've already applied force and achieved our goal. If I come in too hard now, I could completely blow up this root system that allows me to do this kind of severe work. I could break down these walls, I could shatter this ring of fine roots, and I would be compromising the tree's ability to survive. If I handle this responsibly, I have nothing, and I literally mean nothing to worry about in this operation. So it just depends. Can you be proactively solving problems before you start to challenge or compromise the tree's health in order to be able to do the actions that are necessary to maximize its bonsai quality? That's, that's really what we're doing here. Uh, Keegan wants to know, uh, says, we know that the sheen is the center of the tree's strength and power, but are there scientific theories about why this is the case? Um, so when you start to talk, yeah, that's a huge question. <laughs> <laughs> Should we save that one for q and I, I feel like I, I feel like that would be an amazing Q&A question, just to sort of after having this stream executed in the way, I mean, this this couldn't have worked out better tonight for what we're getting to see inside of this root system. I mean, this is exactly what I wanted to show. Like, this is so exactly what I wanted to show. I'm like tickled pink to show this to you guys. And also, this is really complex. So I'm very focused on what I'm doing here because this is a valuable tree that I care about a lot and this operation is risky, okay? But I would love to be able to diagram some of these concepts that are, you know, the light bulbs are coming on for you guys as you're watching this, just like, oh, okay, yeah, but what about this? But what about that? Those questions, those are the most important questions we can, we can answer. So let's, let's come back to that in the Q&A. Cool. Um, Vern and Eric are both wondering if you would do any pruning on this tree anytime soon or when. Um, so I'm gonna let the first flush of needles come out on this guy before I come back and I do anything 
anything even remotely severe to it or re reduce it. I'm gonna let the needles drive the recovery process from what we've done tonight. And, I, and again, because it has the needle mass built up, I have no apprehensions whatsoever that this tree is gonna be just fine. It'll be, it'll be completely fine. But if I try to do too much on this tree with this kind of action having taken place, I could be, I could be very detrimental to the tree. Andrew asks, if you didn't have a greenhouse, when would you do this repotting? Andrew lives in Pennsylvania. So since the cuticle is thick on Ponderosa, would you put it into the sun or protect it for a few weeks? Protect it. Protect it mainly because you don't want it to try and you don't want it to test the uh, ability for the tree to replenish the water. So it's not like um, you don't need to drive photosynthesis. It's got all the stored energy in a tree that has this kind of density. It's got the stored energy to be able to handle this kind of work. That's, that's kind of one of the fundamental ideas of, of doing this second as well, as you've got the needle mass to help it recover. But um, you don't wanna push the level of transpiration or water loss by putting it in direct sun because it is gonna be compromised in the root system and we just wanna let those sugars and starches really focus on improving the root growth um, and driving growth in the foyer mass of the tree as much as it can. Okay, Charles asks, if we wanna move a tree to an aesthetically better pot, even though the tree has been in its current pot for maybe only like a year, are you better off not touching the root ball and just settling it in? Or no. should you always loosen it up? You can't, you cannot, if it has mat matted roots, you cannot put matted roots into a containerized environment and expect to have success. It's just simply not possible. So you do have to disrupt that root growth a little bit to set it up to have success. And that is where the risk run, is run in doing successive repots rapidly in rapidly close succession. Okay, uh, Brett wants to know what size 111 mix will you be using for this pine? Um, so we're using 1 8 to 1 quarter. We took the 16th out since it's a long needle single flush pine. Uh, so 1 8 to 1 quarter is what we're using 111 Akadama pumice lava. And that, that is, um, that is going to give us the very best balance of water and oxygen and refinability for our long needle single flush pines. All right, um, Paul wanted to know if you could explain the compression necessary concept. So the compression, so an Anderson flat isn't a ceramic vessel. And, and when you talk about trying to get a tree that back buds and has shorter needles, Paul asked, should you put this into an Anderson flat until you're ready to show the tree? Well, you're never gonna get a tree ready for show in an Anderson flat. It's not a containerized environment that facilitates refinement. It's not, an Anderson flat is to maximize growth, to maximize water and oxygen exchange and make the tree produce growth and root mass faster. It doesn't refine. The bonsai container is what makes a tree refine. It reduces needles. It, it compresses the growth so that it's tighter and more compact, and that's really where we get the benefit is in the bonsai container, reducing the proportions of the tree. So that's the compression component, compression of the growth, compression of the comp proportion by the compression of the root mass. Okay, uh, also from Paul, what happens if there's so much field soil removed that the outer ring starts to break down? Then you've gone too far. We have two Pauls in chat, they're but, not all the same But, Paul. but, okay, if, if you just kind of look, hey Zeus, go ahead and focus right in here, okay? Take a look at what's happening here. You see that? You seeing that, Josh? Okay, this is very, very dangerous now. I'm, I'm, I'm walking the line of the root system being fragile. Of course I am. In the first repot, we're walking the line of, of keeping the root system intact to get it into a bonsai container. It makes sense that in the second repot, we're trying to keep it in that bonsai container, but we're changing out everything from the first, that you're gonna do largely a 50% plus reduction of the root mass here, and it is going to challenge the integrity of your root system. So now I've gotta be very on point with my application of technique to make sure that I don't do anything silly that could potentially compromise this tree's ability to endure this operation that we've put it through, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna prop it. 
to hold it in place and take the weight off the root system. I'm gonna do some container preparation right now. And really where I wanna get you guys to is the soil insertion process so you can see how we use those central holes to insert that soil and set up that sheen. And then we'll finish off the repotting process sort of off camera because I think, are we close to eight? Uh, it's 7.45. Oh, oh, huh. yeah. we might make it. All right, let me hustle through this. Sam, ask me all the questions you can while I'm doing the mindless act of all right. container preparation and throwing tools. Here we go. <laughs> After uh, Tossing ap sharp things around <laughs> back here. You gotta stop throwing sharp <clears throat> stuff. Yeah, I know. Um, so Tom <clears throat> asked, after the first potting, what prevents the old center material from staying too wet and causing root rot and new soil drying out too much? What's that? So I think actually I know the answer to this, but Tom asks, after the first potting, what prevents the old center material from staying too wet and causing root rot and the new soil from drying out too uh, much? So this is a great question. It's the same thing that caught that in the first potting with, the, with that really, uh, really loose exterior soil that keeps it from staying too wet. And that is it hasn't scaled yet. This is why we filter out the 1 16th. We control particle size diligently because we know that that particle size is what holds the water, the air spaces allow the balance. That core is gonna have this really beautiful, larger air space in it, and the roots are gonna naturally gravitate to that in this beautiful ox oh, oxygen-rich soil in the core, where it's just been mud and blah, just decomposed soil from the mountain for hundreds of years, and now it's like, oh, you know, it's like somebody drowning in the water and then they break the surface and you can almost feel in the movie when they take that first breath, just <gasps> how beautiful that felt. Well, imagine that happening with the tree. That's what's going on. Uh, Eric wants to know if you ever worked with second repottings from the field in Japan or was it only established trees? Um, I worked with first repottings, second repottings, third, fourth, fifth, 10th, 20th repottings. I've seen everything. I've literally... Uh, there, there probably is not, you know, thousand year old tree, tree that's been a bonsai for 300 years. Uh, I mean, I've seen it all. I've, uh, I've gotten to work with every root system possible. I will say though, that the wor root work that we have to do with Yamadori trees in this transition from the mountain soil to where we're, where we're at now, where it's fully transitioned out, far more challenging on a continual basis because we do it in such a larger quantity than we ever did it in Japan. We worked with so many established trees in Japan, but Mr. Kimura had field grown trees. Mr. Kimura had collected trees. He had urban Yamadori. He had, uh, you know, first potting, second pot. I mean, we did, he, he, he still sort of spanned the gauntlet of, of the repotting opportunities, which was really valuable to get to experience. It only, it only created the seed for the strategy of how we go about this though, because you know, if I were there for six years, and this is where you guys have to understand, man, bonsai education, six years was still a blip. I've learned, you know, I learned more than I ever thought I would have in Japan in six years, and I've learned more than I ever thought I would have that I didn't learn in Japan in the past 10, being home. And one of them was really establishing the techniques and this system to be able to get our Yamadori to a point where they don't suffer from disease, they don't suffer from random weakening, we can deal with the pathogens. Uh, this is all, this isn't what Mr. Kimura necessarily preached or did. It was just a part of the process that we've sort of expanded on beyond that back at Mirai. Uh, Moon wants to know if this foliage is naturally reduced or grafted. <laughs> No, this is, this, is, uh, this is why this pot is so important. This, these needles used to be this long. On, I mean, I'm not kidding. The needles used to be three, four times the length that they are now when this tree first started. I mean, this is truly the product of why we put a tree in a bonsai pot right here. Uh, Steiner asks, how long until you put the tree in full sun again? Um, yeah, so I'm going to, I'll put this in the greenhouse and then I'm looking, you know, and this is where I always try to bring the conversation back to what are my indicators? What are my indicators? What are my indicators? What are my indicators? Because there is no time frame. I'm not looking at a calendar and being like in three weeks, this guy goes back outside because I don't know how it's going to feel about what we just did. Probably feels a little bit violated, probably you know, isn't super psyched, but also it's like, I know we needed to do that. 
Like I had to take my kid to get, you know, a shot the other day and he was like, I don't want to. And I was like, kids, you know, it's kind of what we got to do. Uh, and he was like, at the end, he's like, okay, you know, I did that because I needed, you know, I needed that to be stronger, uh, you know, for whatever. Anyways, um, that's what the tree is. It's like, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want for you to just take out the core of my root system, but it wasn't good for me, and I know I'm going to be stronger as a result of it. So over the course of the next three or four weeks, as temperatures increase, I'm going to be watching this tree. How frequently does it dry out? Is it producing new roots as indicated by the, uh, the frequency that it dries out? Do I see the buds continue to move? Do they actually start to open a little bit, potentially? If they do, then maybe I move it into a shady area outside of the greenhouse, okay? And if they continue moving forward and it continues drying out and the buds continue to open, then maybe I move it into a more exposed area of the garden. And probably in two months, it'll be back in full sun. But I would never just be like, all right, you should be good. I'm gonna drop you out in full sun tomorrow, bud. You know, cause it's not ready for that. Not, if this were a standard repot, sure, right? Took off the surface sides, bottom, the, the sheen's already traded out, the edges are already built. Uh, put it back out in full sun. I have no problem with that. Not an issue at all. But when we do this kind of invasive work, we've got to be a little more careful. All right. So Paul has a question about energy. Um, he says, it looks like 80% of the root, the roots have been removed and thus 80% of energy. Will new growth be fueled by trunk storage or new photosynthesis? Also, the foliage will be really thirsty. Are there enough roots left to supply new water? Totally, totally. Because the root system, and again, this is where you guys really have to make these transitions. I didn't remove a lot of root. I removed coarser roots. I removed a lot of field soil and left behind the structural roots that attach to the fine roots. But here's the big thing. The soil that's left is the Akadama that we put in 10 years ago, the Akadama pumice lava mix. And that Akadama pumice lava mix scaled with the roots and the roots got finer and the Akadama and lava and pumice got finer and it scaled and it scaled and it scaled. The water uptake capacity of the fine root system that exists in that domesticated soil from 10 years ago far exceeds what this tree needs to hydrate itself. I have no apprehension because I didn't cut the fine roots off of the tree, right? I took out the, root, the soil that wasn't allowing those to develop and grow. It's got more than enough to hydrate itself uh, and it's probably, and when we think about storage, to say that the roots are the only storage device on this tree is, is incorrect, okay? The roots are a storage device in the vascular system. The trunk is a storage device in the vascular system. The branches are a storage device in the vascular system. And the needles have a storage amount and capacity where the cell is loaded with sugars and starches and dissolved solutes that are absorbed from the chlorophyll in the fall, which is what causes this yellowish color over the winter. All of those areas with those stored resources are what contribute to the growth. So just because I remove the roots, it's not like, okay, you cut off all the roots, now there's no stored energy, what's it gonna do? It's like, well, no, there's, there's a majority of the roots that were in the container are still on the tree. Plus, it's got all of the tissue that it had prior to that that still has all that stored energy. This tree didn't lose you know, 50% of its energy. It's got a ton of energy. That's why we have this needle mass and why this is appropriate, right? So don't, don't be so black and white, like, oh my gosh, you cut off a root, there goes all your energy. That doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that at all. Uh, Joseph asks, what are the consequences of a pot and soil mass that are too large for the tree? Super gigantic long needles, big, long, thick, coarse branches, low levels of ramification in the tree. I mean, the tree just is able to grow with a lot more vigor. It's hard to reduce the proportions of the tree. And you know, if you've ever had a tree where you've wired it and pruned it back and it looked all nice and then it just exploded in growth and you're like, holy cow, now I just gotta do the exact same thing over again. And you prune it back and you wire it and explodes in growth again. That's what happens in too big of a container. You can't control it. There's no scaling mechanism to reduce the rate of growth, get finer ramification, finer development, shorter inner nodes, finer needles, and reduce that proportion to get that denser tree. So much of the work that happens in the United States, Canada, uh, you know, North America, Europe, Australia, South Africa, so much of the work that happens is just, is just work where we're just 
re repeating the same operation because we don't understand that we haven't set the root system up to enable us to actually get a refined tree. So we wire it and style it and prune it and it, and it blows out. And then we wire it and style it and prune it and then son of a gun, blows out again. And then we wire it and style it and prune it and then it just does it again, doggone it, right? Why is that happening? The containerized environment isn't set up to facilitate the refinement. Okay, that, that's the, this, is the, this is the goal of bonsai. This is the action of the ceramic vessel. And I only say that as passionately as I do because I'm just as guilty as every single person who's been like, why isn't this thing working, right? Like in college, black pines, I'd like decandle them and then hammer them with fertilizer and be like, please give me short needles. And it was like, it's never gonna happen when you fertilize it after decandling. And I would put a tree in a giant container and I'd be like, please get compact. And it's never gonna happen, you know? And, and so it's, I, I, I very much sympathize with like, how does all of this work? Like trying to figure that out inside of our, inside of our bonsai minds, because it is quite a, an unnatural situation. Uh, and then Bill wants to know if you're going to rethink the planting angle as a result of exposing the nabari to the extent that you have. No, no. I mean, I'm, I'm very happy with where the nabari is to facilitate the planting angle. It actually reinforces uh, what, what I had done with the design of the tree. And I'm super, super stoked with, with what we've got. I mean, I think it's a beautiful, I think it's a beautiful marriage and, and uh, meshing of aesthetics and function with the current root system that we've uncovered and its evolution in the bonsai pot, I'm pumped, pumped. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue to drive this tree forward. I think this angle is the best meshing of all of the different components of the tree. That's all the questions we have for right now. Okay, I'm so. almost done with the prep and then we'll, we'll set it up and we'll Get this thing repotted, doggone it. Uh, Eric does um, ask if you could explain what strength in a pine resides in the roots means again. Um, well, so, yes, I can. Let me just do a little something something here. Let me get one more wire in here. I'm kind of trying to function very delicately. This pot is a very old Yamaki pot. Uh, and it has beautiful patina, so I'm just trying to uh, preserve, not move it around a whole bunch. And these feet are, um, you only have to knock off one stair step Donashi foot before you realize like, oh, okay, when I'm working with a pot like this, no matter who made it and where it's from, uh, I've gotta be very, very careful with that, that attachment point. So I'm just kind of focusing on that, but I will come back to what is the strength in pines lies in the roots mean. Um, following up with Paul, um, where we were talking about energy and removing so many other roots, um, Paul says he gets it. It's like millions of fine roots contain most of the energy and water and mineral uptake. The roots that the scraper removed were old and not very efficient. Is that correct? No, not, not old. They were matted. So there's okay. no way that I can keep those on the tree, have water and oxygen move through the tree. And, uh, they were still functioning, but they weren't necessarily the most pivotal roots for the tree's facilitation of that uptake of water and nutrition in the core of the root mass. We still remove roots, okay? So we're, we're oscillating on a little bit of an extreme in this conversation where we're saying, okay, we, we took off all the roots, now we have no energy, we didn't take off any roots. I'm saying, we took off some energy, we didn't take off enough to be worried about it, and there's so many parts of the tree that have energy, we're cool, we're cool, we're totally cool, that's it. Okay. So now that I've got that, let me go ahead and put my interior layer. Now let me just talk to you a little bit. Because we've got this root system that is relatively fragile now, right? Uh, we've got this ring around the edge. Okay, we've got the ring around the edge. So trying to grab that ring of roots and hope that it's gonna secure the trunk it is a bad idea, right? There's, there's gonna be nothing fruitful. And particularly on the left side of this root system right here, we saw that that was very flexible. So in my tie down strategy, Jesus, go ahead and blast in just to the top of this. And Josh, let's show them the tie down. Let me know when we're there. Okay, 
So in the tie down strategy, I don't have a wire here to tie to that left side of the root system that's super floppy. That would be like, uh, why don't we just ask to tear that off? I've got this that can tie to some of the thicker roots that are, that are inside. This will be pulled inside of the ring. I've got this because the back side is really stable. And I've got this for that nabari that moved and holds the movement of the tree to the left. So that's my tie down strategy based on the creation of the ring system inside of the tree. Okay. Now on the interior, I know that the central core of this is really, really hollow. And it's so hollow, I know that I'm not gonna be able to fill that core with this cone of soil, which is why I've got the entry points from the top to be able to fill those locations. There's no way I could get this filled. And inside of this, I don't wanna make this cone so big. When I set this down, it props the tree up out of the container and there's no way where for that uh, soil mass to escape because I've still basically got the roots intact around the edge of this container, okay? So I'm gonna go with a relatively healthy central cone and I'm gonna leave my, my soil mass fairly low. And this gives me the flexibility because I have the entry sites on the surface of the tree to be able to insert soil into that core. That's why this is okay. That's why that's okay. And as long as we understand that, we can work inside of that system, okay? Grant um, would like you to go over the aesthetic considerations of this container and talk a little more about it. Okay, um, let me get the tree in it and get it anchored. Because cool. that's causing me huge anxiety. Okay. And then, and then right. we, we will come back and we will, we will aesthetic it up. Aesthetic it up. Okay, I'm going to pull this to the inside of that. So I need to just set myself up for success here. This is a big one. This is a big stream. I was excited about this one. It completes a cycle of knowledge that people have wanted and needed. And I am happy that Mariah can bring it to them, but it's also not the, not the easiest stream to execute live because there's so many things happening that demand a lot of attention and, and sort of um, really intense on point technique. Um, for your the layer of soil that you just put in there, that's the same mix as everything else, right? Or is it larger particle size? So I did the, I did the aeration on the bottom, which is our, our um, one quarter inch to one half. And then I did the, the one eighth to one quarter. I took the one sixteenth out, but it's our standard interior soil size minus the one sixteenth. Okay, okay. Look at that. Look at that handsome feller. Way to go. Does that look handsome? That looks handsome, doesn't it? Extremely handsome. So dapper. You, you, aw oh, shucks, you guy. Okay, let me take a look. Oh, look at that base now. Whoo! Okay, so we notice and we see how much this, the level of that surface has dropped. Now we've dropped the tree down in. We took off obviously that bottom layer, but notice how important and imperative this root system is to hold that movement to the left. And the presence of this gives stability to the design. Ugh, that's what we wanted, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna, before I even settle this into the container, because I still have to work it down into the soil, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna drive my anchoring chopstick into this root mass right here. And I'm gonna do so because once I settle it, this is how I'm gonna lock it into the, um, into the actual container. And I don't have my hammer, so big money, no shattered pots. Big money, no shattered pots. Okay, and so it's got some stability, but it feels a little bit, little bit flexible because we do have that reduction. So let's go ahead and let's go in two areas. Watch how I do this here. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna cross them up like an X. Okay, 
So I cross them up like an X and now I'm pulling on two different portions of the root systems with those tips to be able to extend that, uh, that, that anchoring across a wider amount of the root mass. Ush. Actually, let me leave that a little bit loose right there. Okay, so let's go ahead and settle. Let me square up my tree here just so that I make sure that I'm very, very happy with what we have happening here. Oh, that sucks. It's a good thing we have callus, mate. Okay, how do I feel about that? Feels like she's leaning just a little bit too much. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna support here. I'm gonna go ahead and it feels like it's leaning a little bit, so I'm just gonna pull it up. Okay. All right, and then I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna, I'm gonna adjust my prop now to hold that change of angle. A little bit straighter up, a little bit more elevated. Now we've got that apex a little bit more propped up and I like that. Now notice how my chopsticks drop down as I settled and I get that Nabari right to the edge of the container. Now it's really set down in that container. Now I can go ahead and I can secure this and just make sure that I, I take a lot of the weight off of that block. Make sure my wires are nice and up and in. There you guys go. Perfect. Now. <sighs> Not working with me tonight. All right, let's let's focus on this for a sec. Okay, so here's what happened. Busted the tie down wire, trying to avoid that chopstick. Eve, can you focus right here? Can you see that? Can you see this broken piece right there? Yeah. Okay, watch how I do this. Okay, so basically I got a little overzealous I broke my tie down wire, so I'm gonna take a nice fresh piece. I'm gonna dig in here and I'm just gonna cross it over as if I were tying these two together, okay? Now I've gotta be careful because I've got a lot of different components in this system sort of moving in different directions. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna twist this being sure to not challenge that tie down right there. And essentially what I've done is I've just tied this together so that I can pull this piece up and over and get to an untouched piece of this wire to again tie down. Okay, this happens, it's a part of it. It's definitely a part of steel wire for sure. Have to know how to deal with it so that it doesn't ruin your day. Safety, safety, all right. Oh, that was so scary. Okay, so this is tied now. Now in this instance where I've got two solid root masses over the top here and this is just below the surface, I'm actually gonna tie down a bridge right here. This isn't something that I typically practice as a tie down methodology, but in this instance, it's gonna be a really beautiful use of those two solid areas over that big gap that we're spanning since we've been able to get the root system down and into the container so much. So watch closely. I'm gonna take a nice flat piece of bamboo. I'm gonna span it right across the surface. It attaches to this strong area and this strong area right through the middle of these two. Go ahead and cut that piece. I'm gonna make sure that my wires are nice and tight to the bottom of my container. Cross them up. Come right down through the middle. <sighs> 
and use the compression of that on the hard side of the bamboo, the compression of that bamboo to anchor that piece into the container. Really nice below the surface, great use, just sort of a, a creative use of, of what we had at our disposal in that region of the tree. And last, I'm gonna go ahead and the back side was the side that we said was solid. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna drive in just my standard bamboo into the back side. Being very careful to not throw off. Nice, nice catch, nice hold. Our fundamental bamboo tie down methodology to the compact portion of the root system cutting my wires so they don't destroy the bark on my tree. Last big step to secure the tree. <sighs> okay. Drive that in just to bury that. Boom. Okay. All right, let's see how this looks in terms of holding. Yeah, beautiful hold. There's no soil in the container, so I'm gonna leave this here just to give me support through the repotting process. Drive that in, boom, okay. So now I can come back. Now here's the deal. In the order of operations to appropriately fill this, I first need to get soil between the ring of roots and the container, right? We never wanna push roots up against the wall of the container. We took off all of those matted roots. Now we need to integrate soil between these two spaces before we ever start filling the central portion of the root mass. If we start in the central portion, we're gonna push that soil and it's gonna push against those roots and it's gonna pin them to the wall and we're never gonna get soil in integrated. We need to have soil between that root mass and the edge of the container first. So I'm even gonna focus so much so that I'm just gonna put soil around this outer ring to make sure that I don't forget what my goal in the chopsticking process is to begin with. Okay, and I'm gonna fill it up really, really nice, right? Now I'm gonna start with a fairly, not a huge chopstick, a relatively small chopstick, okay? If we look at what I'm gonna be using because the space is so tight, can we see that, Josh? Yeah. Okay, so the space is so tight. Now watch, when we go in here, I don't have a tremendous amount of space, okay? I'm really functioning quite tightly up against that root mass that we really didn't want to break down because we left those roots that we had formed intact and I'm just working in between the container and the wall of the container and the roots, integrating that soil in with a nice bulk fill. Okay, I'm not detail chopsticking yet. It doesn't make sense to detail chopstick. If I detail chopstick right now, it's gonna all move to the path of least resistance in the core of the tree. So I'm just making sure I have good integration and I have a relatively stable contact of soil and root along the edge of the container, okay? Once I get this finished, then I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna fill the central core. And I'm gonna fill the central core very diligently. And my final step will be to come back to the external area between the roots and the edge of the container and do a nice deep detailed chopstick all the way to the bottom of the container, chopsticking out to finalize this repot, okay? So this is that order. Make sure there's soil in between them, fill the core with effort, come back and finalize around the edge. Got anything for me, Sam? Well, Rocky wants you to discuss why this is the best front for the tree, but I figured we could do that at the end. Rocky doesn't like my front? Rafi. Oh, um, Rafi. He doesn't necessarily not like your front. He just wants to hear why this is the best one. Oh, best movement, best base, best special features. That's all I got to say. Yeah. Do you see any other potential fronts on this tree? Um... I don't, I don't, because everywhere else that you go, you lose something. And trust me, I've thought long and hard about this tree. Now there are other areas that seem as though they would be attractive until you objectively analyze them. And that's where you can emotionally say, yeah, there could be other areas that would be cool, but there aren't other areas that have all of the qualities. And that's the difference between maxing out a tree and emotionally responding to a tree. 
right? This tree has been objectively designed to really maximize its quality and potential. Cool. And then the last, the the other question we had was the one about the container, going over the aesthetic considerations of the container. Ah, yes. Okay. So um, let's do that at the very end. Cool. Just just so that I can, just so that I can kind of focus on this, and then we can see it in all of its final glory. I think you've got some really excellent like sweat with dirt on your face right now. It's it's really I have good dirt on my face. Like oh yeah, cool. Yeah, it's good. It's very devil may care. It's kind of Rambo-ish, huh? Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, Mr. Kimura, I'll tell you guys all a secret. Everybody, take a shot. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Kimura. <laughs> Mr. Kimura used to call me Rambo. Really? He, yeah, he used to call me Rambo. Now, I still to this day have no idea if Rambo is a Japanese word or if he was calling me Rambo because he thought I was being too rough like Sylvester Stallone. I'm cool with either one. I would prefer the Sylvester Stallone connotation, but I don't know if that's what was happening. Wow. Anyways, that's... so any time that I would like try really, really hard and get a little bit overzealous, which happened a lot, right? Because you're like working really hard to try and like meet his needs, you know, you're his apprentice, you're trying to be like the best apprentice you can possibly be. Uh, he would say, he would say, oi, 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 Ryan, chotto rambo, chotto rambo sugi, meaning you're being a little too much Rambo, <laughs> right? And I was just like, wow, Rambo. And I'd say, you're damn right. <laughs> too much Rambo. Too much Rambo, and I was just like, yeah, I got to back it off. Yeah, my, my muscle's getting swole. Next feature content, Next Ra feature Ryan con running up the stairs of the art museum. Yeah, that's Rocky. but Hol Holding up tree. Yes, that, yeah. That, that's, that's, I know it's Rocky. That's Rocky. Lines joke Rambo, is about Rocky. Rambo would be a little bit different. I could, I, could, I, 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 could, I could see that. I could get into that. Ush. That's how I feel, Lime. <laughs> okay, so you guys can see Right, and, the, and there's, there's a, it's an interesting thing to watch somebody repot because it's really, it's not like, oh my gosh, this is so intense. It's like, holy cow, this is boring. But, but there's something to be learned from this, right? I've downsized my chopstick to a very thin chopstick, okay? And I'm spending a tremendous amount of time in these areas because we didn't reduce the actual width of that root system outside of the matted roots. So there's a lot of space in here that I'm having to occupy with a very small chopstick to be able to keep that root system intact and undamaged and allow it to be the epicenter to, to facilitate re recovery from this operation, right? So to see how hard you have to work or just be aware of the, the areas that you have to be working. You guys see how much I'm staying in these areas to get that soil integrated with a, a really nice small chopstick that gets between the root mass and the edge of the container. These are the little pieces of information that we have to have to do this really well. But I'm getting close, I'm getting close. And then we get the grand finale of the center. Come on, baby. Notice how the, my offhand here is constantly working. I'm not sitting here dilly-dallying. My left hand is always feeding, it's functioning, it's holding soil in place. So I have a good understanding of is it dropping in, is it moving laterally. I, I'm, I'm sort of guiding, I'm making sure that I keep things intact and close to where I'm working to be able to facilitate the best possible efficiency in the operation. This is where this offhand is so incredibly important to the function of all of these different techniques that we're executing in this tree. Thomas asks if uh, you're using like a circular motion with the chopstick, or are you just kind of No, I'm trying to out. come up and down, but what's happening is my chopstick is getting pinched because we've got such a tight space 
And so, uh, and this chopstick being so thin, I call this the mosquito, just because it's just this little tiny, I mean, look at, little tiny chopstick, flat side here. Are we there, Josh? Yep. Flat side here, just a nice little sort of uh, slight angle to the face. But this is what I use to get into those small spaces. And now I've done it. So let's go ahead and take a look at getting into that core. This is really this is exactly where I wanted to get with you guys. So now let's kind of dive in here, okay? Eve, you there? Okay, so I've got this hole right here, and I'm gonna be coming into this hole and filling this hole to make sure that I've got good integration of my chopstick in here, okay? So I'm, I'm coming in here, and at my first instinct, right, I know that I've got a hole here, I know that it's hollow all the way back through here. So I'm gonna be using this chopstick. Now look closely, I'm chopsticking in a leftward direction and I'm just filling that big space. Now, as I'm chopsticking, notice where the nodule of my bamboo is, right? My, ba my face that's pushing the soil is pushing the soil this way, okay? So I'm pushing the soil that way, still pushing the soil that way, I'll kind of get a little deeper, push the soil that way, and once I start to feel that firm up, I start to feel some resistance, watch what I'll do. While still in that same direction, I'll rotate my nodule this way. Now the face of my bamboo is pushing underneath this area. And here's what's crazy. Soil loosens up again and it starts compressing. Look at that. Look at that soil dropping in. Now that soil is moving this way because of that rotation in that area where I've got that hollow cavity in a very limited space to insert it. I've got to use my chopstick appropriately in this instance, okay? So now I know I'm solid here, I'm solid there. Now I'm gonna start rotating in this direction or starting to branch out, okay? So now instead of this way, I've changed my rotation this way. Now I'm filling the root mass that exists underneath the base of the trunk right here. And again, very, very wide open. Look at how open that is. Soil's just falling in there. Plenty of space. Now you would never imagine that from this angle to this angle, there would be that much difference. There's a huge difference, okay? So now that that starts to get really nice and compact, I'm gonna rotate my face, okay? That feels nice and solid. Now I'm gonna come back in this direction. Just feeling for those opportunities, okay? And now that I see that this big thick coarse piece is no longer applicable, I'm gonna step down to a smaller piece and I'm gonna go right back to the same area just to make sure that I wasn't being blocked out of filling just because it was too thick and look there. Now we start to see the soil moving in again. Now it's relatively close and it's relatively compact Okay, so I wanna be, do my due diligence, but I don't wanna compress. So I'll go down to the bottom and then chopstick out, chopstick out, chopstick out, chopstick out, chopstick out, let that soil fill, let it fill, stay disciplined, stay disciplined, stay disciplined. I'm still in, now my chopstick is at the surface, okay? So I've filled here, I've filled here. Now I'm gonna go to the back here, okay? All the way to the bottom and boom, I break through again with a much finer chopstick. I'm gonna go ahead and go soil on top to have that gravity action. To the bottom, chopstick out, chopstick out, chopstick out. Stay in that space, stay in that space. Notice no white knuckles, okay? Nice and relaxed, I've got my thumb slung over the end of this, I'm using the weight, I'm throwing my hand at that and I'm using the weight of my thumb, just sort of the clunk, clunk, clunk of my thumb against that to really compact that soil without crushing that akadama, okay? Now I can come back in here, I can kind of test these other areas just to see, can I break through in these? There's one right there. Okay, now I can come back in this way. Ah, there we go. Trying to avoid the bark. Snag just a little piece, not bad. Um, Rennie asks if you are not minding the fact that the ring of fine roots is pushing inward a little bit since that will reduce the central space. Uh, I don't have a problem in, in, in chopsticking on the interior and pushing that in. I have no problem with that. I would much rather that happen and push those to the interior 
and know that they're going to have a good balance of water and oxygen against the rim of the container, then I would want to push them to the exterior and have them matted up against the edge of the container. Again, I'm just getting this little pocket right here and then I'm going to be able to shift. Perfect. Okay. We're solid there. Feel really good. Now I've got this bamboo stake that's kind of marking this area. I'm going to pull that out and I'm going to immediately place my chopstick back in. I'm going to load up with soil. Okay. And now I'm again working that area and I've got to get that soil in there. So I've got to be sure that I'm getting my chopstick up to the point where I can start to integrate that soil into the system and let it fall in there because it's a fairly big wide open gap. Now I had the central cone that I settled into that root mass. Let me come to the back so that Eve can focus a little bit more. Okay, I had that central cone, but that doesn't mean that it filled all of it. So I've got to get that soil in there. And I'm again, I'm playing the game of orientation of my face. Okay, right now I'm facing you guys with my chopstick. I'm driving soil into this area of the root mass, okay? And I'm just trying to get as much soil into that system, using my offhand to continue feeding. Okay, and it's a big wide open space, so I've got to stay in it. I can't, can't bounce around. There's nowhere to go. I've got to stay in it. I'll get it kind of nice and compact, and then I can start to really work. Once I get it to start to fill up, then I can actually go to the bottom and chopstick out, chopstick out, chopstick out, okay? I'm gonna change my direction. Start working back towards the interior of this trunk right here. Just trying to fill that up and get that soil integrated into all of those areas of the root mass. Okay, and you can see a lot of soil is moving in there. It's getting tighter and tighter. At the top now, let me check again here. Okay, I've got a little bit more space. Let me come back to this angle, working straight towards you guys again. Just trying to get nice soil to root. Still nice and relaxed with my hand. I'm just taking out. Okay, that feels good, that feels good. Now let's come this way. Okay, this side is nice and tight. So this is done. I'm done here, I'm done here. Now I'm working around to the back. Jesus, I'm gonna be right here. Now notice that this is a little bit more of a precarious. Josh, are we seeing what Jesus is seeing? Okay, so this is a little bit more of a precarious area. Watch how I handle this. So I'm going to remove this piece here. I'm going to set my soil scoop right on the edge here. And I'm actually going to use my soil scoop to feed the installation of soil into that hole. See how I take my chopstick and I run it down the middle of the soil scoop? Let me sort of, can you see that, Jesus? Okay, and I just run that soil right into that area right there so that that angle, I'm getting soil integrated directly into the root system right there. Makes it really clean and really easy. My scoop is trapping it right on that lip. And this is how I can fill big, large bulk areas that are void of soil by using my tools to my benefit. So this is a, a soil question, but um, Charles says that he finds the light color of pumice unsightly. What do you think about dyeing pumice gray with sumi ink like you do with sphagnum? Totally could. You totally could. Typically when you top dress, you never see it. So I don't really focus too hard on it. But if you wanted to dye it, it's very possible. Okay. And now that that's getting firm, now I'm going to use my offhand, okay, to the bottom. Start chopsticking out, chopsticking out, chopsticking out, chopsticking out. I'm working directly under the trunk in the direction of the trunk right now. Okay, I'm just going to keep that soil right on top. Okay, it's nice and tight. Now I'm going to rotate. Okay, so watch closely. Now I'm working this way. I'm going to go back into the bottom, chopstick out, chopstick out, and all of a sudden I find a wide open space right here. Notice the soil just sort of falling into that as I use that gravity. Let me take that away so you guys can watch this kind of happen. See it falling into that hole to the bottom. I'm going to come back in. 
Now I'm finding, I'm really finding that space right there. There we go, okay? My chopstick is moving a little bit. It's finding some open spots. So I'm just kind of letting it go where it's going. I'm, I'm sort of staying on task, making sure I check to, make, to find those holes. Okay, now it's really nice and compressed. Relax my hand and just chopstick out. Okay, we're done there. We're done there. Now I'm gonna rotate back towards the camera. Okay, now I'm working towards you guys right here. So this is an interesting thought from Paul who says, there's an app, like a phone app that can get a heat picture of the field in view. Do you think it would be useful after completion of chopsticking to check for holes? Don't know. I don't know if there would be heat inside of the system or not from friction or something. Probably show you where you chopstick more, but I doubt it would show you where there's more holes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we've got another hole right there. We just opened up a little pocket, and this is what happens when we get inside of this system, is those pockets, they're kind of hiding in different places as we get around those structural roots that were on the bottom. Okay, and this is why we kind of push through. You'll, you'll see, I'll chopstick and I'll fill up a space. Fill it up, 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 and then I'll go in. And that kind of gives me, am I, am I just filling up superficially or am I truly full? Because if I'm truly full, when I fill this up and I go in, it should be really solid. And now it's getting solid, so I'll chopstick out, okay? Now I have one last section on the front of this tree. We're almost there, we're so close. And that one last section, I left this piece of bark just to remind me that, I, that was where I kind of botched the system. And let's see if we can find it here. There you are. Okay, and it's really, really hollow right there. So this is important that we make sure that we hit every single section that's at the top of those cones, right? That chopstick came through at the top of the cone. And as I'm rotating my chopstick, I'm filling those cones of soil. And I mean, for such a small container and the size of the root system that's in there, the amount of chopsticking we're having to do is very, very significant. But we took out so much of that core that there's all that space in there. We've got to be able to integrate soil in there or else we're not doing this tree any favors having done that kind of operation to remove that soil. So you understand to remove it. We understand the nuance to remove it. Now you have to understand how to replace it so that we make sure to set this tree up for success. Okay, and when I push through this with this quarter uh, to, to, to one eighth minus the sixteenth, it has a really beautiful feel to it because it does have so much more space than having that sixteenth in there. Now it means we chopstick a little bit more because we have that space, but it has that nice like real nice sort of, you can feel the oxygen in it. It's not as tight, it's not as compact as the 1 16th, okay? Last step, coming back with my fine piece and just really detailed chopsticking in this exterior now. I know that I've got all of the spaces worked out everywhere else. So now I can come back and just finalize this, okay? To the bottom, chopstick out, chopstick out, chopstick out. To the bottom, chopstick out, chopstick out, chopstick out. To the uh, bottom, chopstick out, chopstick out, chopstick out, chopstick out, and stay in it until it's full. Okay, soil's still going in, offhand's still working hard. Your, your chopstick needs to end at the top of the container. Nice and tight, nice and tight. Ooh, right through that. Beautiful. Okay, and it's pretty, pretty well done. I mean, we did a good job in the bulk fill. So do you, um, Charles and 
Rafi both kind of want to know, do you either tap or kind of thump the sides or edges of the pot to help fill these pockets? There is isn't. There is no way that that's going to help you fill these pockets. Okay. Uh, you can do so to kind of settle the surface. Tapping the sides will in no way help you occupy the, the, the spaces that we're, that we're tapping into right now with our chopstick. Okay. Yeah. No, so don't, don't, don't mistake it. This is, this is the process, okay? And, you know, one of the, I can do away with this now because everything is stable. Uh, one of the interesting things uh, as I repot that I continually come back to are, um, you know, sort of the attempt to find ways around the really diligent work that repotting takes. But I think it comes back to sort of what is the product of this methodology? Uh, how has it served us at Mirai? Have we done, you know, three, four, five thousand repots in the past ten years with success, both in terms of the tree surviving as well as the trees refining, the ramification building, the needles reducing, the aesthetic really reaching that point? Yeah, yeah, we have. You know, we we really have. There is no. That is not to say there aren't ways to always improve a system, right? But one thing that I've learned in this process is there is no shortcutting the system either. This is sort of the process to a really, really refined root system. And this year at Mirai, this isn't the first year that we've worked these root systems, but it's the first year that I've worked these root systems with students in terms of doing these really significant second repots and allowing students to, to really engage with the the compaction and learn how to handle the ring and just understand all of the nuances of this. Uh, it took me a couple years to kind of work through the, the handling of it, the system of it, etc. Uh, and it's obviously the first time that we're kind of doing this on the stream to help you guys understand and really sort of prove out that strategy of the, the handling, removal, and perpetuation of refinement and health in the bonsai container via the Mirai system and methodology. Um, so it's, it's rewarding to get to share this with you guys tonight because this has been, you know, like I said, 10 years in the making. It's not been a short journey to get to this point and nobody really taught this to me. I've seen a lot in Japan. I've done a lot at Mirai, but this has been something that we've worked on to try and figure out how does this system work to maximize the quality and the refinability of our native Yamadori, dealing with field soil, dealing with constructing the sheen, dealing with that initial move into a refinable container to construct that usable root system. We sort of checked all the boxes with this strategy and it has been performing very, very well for us in terms of the totality of things, okay? Finish repot nice and contoured. Give myself that eighth to quarter inch for water retention on the edge of the container. We'll go ahead and top dress. Miss the top dressing. Water it thoroughly. This tree is now set up for 10 more years of success in the container. Further refinement in the foliar mass. It's only going to get better as a result of this work tonight. Any other questions? We've got a couple last ones. Um, I'm going to ask a couple and then let's talk about the container. Okay. How long ago did you collect the moss in the top dressing you're going to use? Uh, it's recycled from moss that we took off of another tree in a similar repot this year. So we took it off, we ground it up. It's still even maybe a little bit moist, which makes it take faster, just clumps a little bit. Okay. Uh, and then Andrew wants to know, what did you learn from your most recent repot fatality? I don't think he has a specific one in mind, but if you've had a fatality, what did you learn? Last year we had a limber pine that was sitting in a portion in the greenhouse and the greenhouse was so packed that we couldn't move it away from the water draining off of the bench onto it. And uh, it really helped me realize, it died, and it really helped me realize that it's that drying process after you first water the tree that allows the roots to compartmentalize and produce fine roots. Uh, and if you continue to perpetually keep it wet, a tree will never compartmentalize. That was really the crystallization of that concept and the awareness that we have to let every tree get oxygen back into the system to a large degree before we ever water it again after that initial watering. So I'll water this. 
I won't water this tree again until I see that the top dressing is really pretty dry on the tree. And then I'll go ahead and give it a second thorough flushing. And that system, when I give it that second watering is when compartmentalization has occurred and new root production begins. Um, and that is important. Uh, Paul asks, would you ever do a different color on the sides of the chopstick to give you a reference? I'm not I mean, I, my reference, you know, my reference is always the node. So I'm always, my thumb is always around the node. So where the node is and where the hard side of the chopstick is, obviously your face is always opposite of the hard side of your chopstick. I mean, those are my reference points. So I always have a very consistent awareness of that because I hold the chopstick at the node. Um, as, as my general technique and what I teach students. Um, I guess you could color them if you wanted to, and if that helped you visually, no harm in that. Uh, and then, where did that last one go? Dang it. Um, after you water for the first time, do you let the soil dry out to regain balance? So I top dress, and I really let the top dressing dry out and tell me that that water content in the soil column has evened out to a point where it is relatively dry and there's a high oxygen content. If I'm just dealing with bare soil, then I'll definitely check below the surface to make sure that there's still a little bit of moisture in it because you never want to let the soil thoroughly dry out. And that's where the top dressing is a great indicator of moisture content in the container. I'm more looking at the top dressing as my guide or I'm letting the surface of the soil dry out, looking to see if there's a little moisture down inside of it a little ways. And once I see that dryness on the surface, I'll go ahead and water. Yeah, so it's, you know, but the top dressing, I let the top dressing dry. Well, tell us about this container. Okay, the pot. All right, so this is a beautiful pot. And here's the thing. This is a lotus style pot, a moco style pot, which when we look at a lotus style, it sits in between the rectangle and the oval. It has the masculine aspect of the geometry with the corners in terms of that sort of, uh, the, that masculine rectangular form. It's got the curvaceousness and the reduction of that space of the rectangle with that inset. So we've got that lobed curve, we've got the loss of that positive space that would exist in the corner of the rectangle. And this is why it's for trees that maybe have angular movement, which would be masculine, but a thinner trunk, which would be feminine, or a thicker trunk, which would be masculine, and a curvaceous movement, which would be feminine. It's sort of this tweener, you know, like, is it masculine, is it feminine? It's kind of in the middle. This isn't an overly massive trunk. It's not, uh, a, a, it's not a weak trunk, though, and it does have fairly jagged angular movement. So with that slenderness and that angular movement, this moco style or the lotus style felt like a great shape. Slightly dark reddish hue works really well with a conifer, right? The darker color tends to touch on some of the strengths of the tree. A lighter color works with a more delicate tree. I don't consider it delicate. I just don't consider it fully masculine. Color works very well. And to elevate it with the stair step feet up off of the, uh, the surface of the bench starts to lighten the composition. And originally this tree had about 25% of what's here now. It was very light. The gins are very thin and delicate, even though they're rugged, they're not thick, they're not massive, they're not chunky. That elevation in space, a little bit of ornamentation for the details that do occur throughout the tree, it has a lot of visual interest. Okay, color touching to some strength, the lotus style tapping into that middle ground of masculine feminine in terms of girth and movement, perfect container for this tree, striking that balance of all of those characteristics. I love this combination. I still, I gravitate towards Western pots with Western trees. There's probably not a better container for this particular tree than this Japanese Yamaaki uh, Moko pot. That's it. Oh, we did it. We did it. What time is it? 8.45. 8.45. Thank you guys for sticking with me. I hope that that was valuable. It completes the cycle of a very major aspect of the Mirai repotting methodology that you needed to know. We had to do it. We did it. Yes. Take this knowledge, wield your sword wisely and with caution. Use it. Apply it. Improve your bonsai. Thank you, guys. It's been a great night. Have a good week.